Good morning and welcome to this the 16th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Can I make the usual request that any mobile devices are switched on to airplane mode? We have apologies this morning from our colleague Alec Cole Hamilton. Um, agenda item one this morning is um, a, a decision on taking the consideration of forthcoming legislation in private at future meetings. Are committee content to do that? Agreed. Yep. Okay, so moving on to our substantive item on the agenda this morning. It's a continuation of our bullying harassment of children and young people in schools in Scotland inquiry. Um, we have quite a big panel this morning and we are very uh, happy that you could all come along and contribute because we want to uh, ensure that the recommendations we make to government are very well informed and the way we do that is to talk to as many organisations and especially young people's organisations as we possibly can. Later this morning we will have a second panel looking at um, faith and faith skills and the issues that are faced with uh, bullying uh, with people with faith and also the challenges that maybe those skills have uh, in, in modern society. Um, Yesterday, the committee met informally with um, a group of young women from across different sectors, and we have some of them with us this morning. Um, and we should have, you know, as open and robust a, a, a conversation as we possibly can. Um, there is some very sensitive uh, information that will be shared this morning. Please uh, share that because we do need, need to hear it, but we understand some of the sensitivities around that. And if you can be sure that you don't uh, identify anyone in, in, maybe in your contributions uh, just to maintain um, confidentiality and the sensitivity around that. I'm going to go round the table and allow everyone to introduce themselves and tell me a wee bit about who you are and what you do and maybe why you're here and then we can go into questions after that if people are comfortable. So I'm Christina McKelvey and I'm the convener of the committee and the MSP for Hamilton, Lark, Hall and Stonehouse. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Jeremy Balfour. I'm one of the Lovian MSPs, and I wonder quite often why I'm here. Hi there. I'm uh, Derek Allen. I'm the rector or head teacher of Kirkcaldy High School in Fife, uh, and I think we've been invited uh, on a recent track record in, in creating a, an inclusive and welcoming school ethos. Uh, I'm Cameron Bowie. I'm a fifth year student at Kirkcaldy High School and I'm also the chairperson for the LGB LGBT club at that school. I'm Gail Ross. I'm the member of the Scottish Parliament for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. Annie Wells. I'm the member of Parliament for Glasgow Region. Hi, I'm Nimi Geekin. I'm a student and one of the members of the Stamp Project in Lanarkshire. I'm Mary Fee and I'm a member of the Parliament from West Scotland. Uh, I'm Hannah Brisbane, I'm a girl guiding advocate and we're here today to talk about sexual harassment in schools. Hi, I'm Susie McGuinness, I'm also from Girl Guiding Scotland with Hannah. David Torrance, MSP, Kirkcaldy constituency and can I declare an interest convener as a member of the Scout Association? Anne Whiteford from Scout Scotland, I have a national role in charge of development for Scout Scotland. Thank, thanks very much. Um, you see we've got quite a diversity uh, around the table from schools who are using their leadership to change the, the culture and, and, and the ethos of the school to young people's organisations, uniformed and non-uniformed, and to the, the Stamp Project, who I know very, very well in Lanarkshire and the work that, that, that they, they do. I, I suppose for us, we are coming quite close to the end of this inquiry. We've, we've heard a number of uh, uh, pieces of evidence around about, you know, the organisations within schools, whether it's at government level, local authority level, we've heard about the input that teachers have, that young people have, especially around about maybe some of their, their committee work that they do when they become spokespeople in their school, the spokespeople from organisations and, um, uh, and the work that they do as well. So as you can see, it's a whole community approach. It's not just about nine o'clock to three o'clock. Um, it's, it's the whole day and it's the contribution that all of these organisations organisations make. I suppose my first question is, um, we've got excellent written evidence from, from most of you this morning and we're very grateful for, for that and some very clear statistical information in that. And I know that the Girl Guiding Association have been doing some uh, clear work and you've got bang up to date statistics. So I may, maybe I'll, I'll come to you first, um, uh, uh, Susanna and Hannah, and ask you to tell us a wee bit about the campaign that you've been involved in and the things that you think maybe the committee should be looking at and the recommendations we should make to government. 
Uh, yeah, so basically um, every year, like you say, we do a survey um, as Girl Guiding UK um, and one of our roles as advocates is to kind of design the questions for that survey um, to kind of decide what we want it to focus on. And in the 2015 survey, um, which goes out across the UK to all girls um, from 7 to 21, um, whether they're in Girl Guiding or not, um, one of the main issues that came back in 2015 was um, the levels of sexual harassment in schools. So one of the biggest um, statistics was that 59% of girls had experienced something, um, some sexual harassment in schools. Um, so in response to that, we, as Girl Guiding UK, kind of came back up with this campaign um, to basically end that, because we don't think it's acceptable. And from that, Girl Guiding Scotland, we've taken um, our own approach in Scotland, um, and that's why we've been invited today. I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, so sort of what we're hoping for is um, for it to be improved through better PSE in schools, um, which is compulsory and high quality for schools to have a duty to prevent and tackle sexual harassment and to keep a record of that and be held accountable. And for there to be national guidance in place for schools so they know how they can take a zero tolerance uh, approach to that and how to be effective in tackling it in their schools. I see from your evidence, but you, and you, you've just told us, 59% of girls aged 13 to 21 felt they had to f face some form of sexual harassment or at yeah, school or, or, or in college. Um, obviously, a big part of what we need to look at now is how that's tackled and how it's handled, especially um, as it's not in the school day, it's, it's wider than that. Uh, one of the recommendations that, that you have in, in your, your um, paper is around about online and how we handle online uh, bullying. Now, we had some evidence yesterday from a young person from Aberdeen who's working al along with my colleague Gillian Martin and some of the work that they're doing in their school. And I'm going to come to schools in a wee second um, to, to, to talk about this. But if you get any more insight that you think that we should know around about how, how to tackle that, how you would maybe give guidance to, to, to young women, in particular the young women you're working with, and how to cope with that, and what the reaction has been when they've taken that forward to maybe a teacher or, or a head teacher. Yeah, so I think what we'd like to see is much more for guidance teachers in schools to feel much more equipped to deal with like sexual harassment that's happening online because obviously something that's we've seen a lot and young people have spoken about a lot is things being put on Snapchat um, and that going around schools and um, really young girls having nudes taken and leaked. Um, and it's something that's quite shocking to a lot of adults, but it's something that's very widespread in schools and it goes under the radar because it's something that's not happening in a classroom. So, so teachers aren't sure if they're allowed to deal with it, what steps they should be taking, whether the police should be involved with that. Um, and obviously that's a really upsetting thing for girls to be dealing with in school. And we'd like to see um, teachers knowing how to deal with that. Because um, I know from my experience and our friend Katie, who can't be here today, but she was in yesterday talking about this, um, we know of instances where there's, there's been girls who've ha been filmed being assaulted, um, like non-consensual like footage of rape going around schools and that not being reported or dealt with because it's a frightening thing. It's so large that teachers don't know who to go to and they don't know how to deal with that. So often it does just go unreported and when it does get reported, it can often make it worse because it's not being dealt with appropriately because they don't know the steps they can take. So we'd like guidance teachers in schools to know the steps that they should be taking and know how to report things so that it is going to the police and that, that young men are seeing the consequences of those actions because if they don't see the consequences, then we're creating a culture where this is an acceptable thing to be happening in schools and it's, it's not, <laughs> it's yeah. very clearly not. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Susanna. Derek Allen, you, you've heard a sort of a plea for the, 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 and that's one aspect about how girls feel at, at school. And I know that that you have uh, attempted to deal with a number of aspects in your school, whether it's LGBTI issues, or it's teenage pregnancy, or or uh, indeed um, some of the the bullying harassment that happens. Can you maybe give us an insight into how your school took that on board, took responsibility for it, and have changed that culture? Well, do certainly happy to do that. I'm just interested in um, Susanna's comments there, though. I'd, fi I'd find that really frightening that um, guidance teachers wouldn't know that's a clear child protection issue that would be handled, and there's very, very clear guidance um, for all teachers about how to progress these things and report them appropriately. In Kirkcaldy High School yesterday, actually, we had the police in with NHS Fife colleagues um, talking to young people about sexting, 
um, and, and keeping safe online. Uh, and one of the things that we've done effectively, I think, in that area is uh, have a peer mentoring role for, for senior pupils with younger ones, because often it's very young children who are sharing inappropriate images of themselves for you know, making themselves uh, vulnerable. Um, but, but what you're describing, online footage of assault like that is dreadful. And I'd hate to think that um, any school in Fife wouldn't be well equipped to, to handle that. <coughs> I'm sure they would. Yeah. Realising is that that's, that's girls aged 12, 13 that that's happening to. And I think that's more of a case for PSE and education about mm -hmm. consent and about online abuse needs to be much, much earlier. It needs to be the end of primary school, in my eyes. And by primary six, I was sitting in classrooms where boys were taking it in turns to see who could shout rape the loudest. Um, so I think teachers need to realise mm -hmm. that it needs to be much, much earlier to combat yeah. that. Yeah, a lot of our stats actually come from seven to the age group of 7 to 12, so which is always quite surprising mm -hmm. to a lot of people because they think mm -hmm. it happens a lot later. It's actually happening yeah. a lot earlier. Yeah, uh, to, to go back to your, go, to your original back point, Convener, yeah, yeah. I mean, for us, I think the, the key thing is that prevention is far better than cure, and bullying policies in school are very important, of course, as frameworks, but you would always want to get to the point where it's, it's minimised. Uh, through the school culture being of the kind whereby it's not acceptable, it's not thought cool to be cruel, if you like, uh, and building up a, a, a culture and ethos that is inclusive. I, I was particularly struck when, it, when I, just before I became a head teacher, when I, I did a study tour of Canada as part of an Education Scotland trip, and they were very big on character education in Ontario. They had a very specific curricular insert where they looked at different values of honesty and trust and fairness and respect. Uh, and that these are the, are the kind of messages I took back when I took over at Kirkcaldy High School as head, uh, or became head, I should say. Uh, took over sounds another grand uh, way of saying it. Uh, but we've built a, a kind of values-based culture, and, and the three core values are respect for self, respect for others, and respect for learning. And we're trying to make that the drumbeat of the school, if you like. Uh, there's lots of posters, there's lots of discussion of these issues within the first few weeks of secondary school <coughs> and several subject areas, they become the theme of the lessons. Uh, and, and core to that is, I think, giving pupils a strong voice and allowing them to call out and be equipped to challenge those who are uh, not treating others fairly or, or bullying others. Uh, and one of those things, of course, is, is, is based on this culture of equality, and in particular, taking an issue such as LBG, LGBT issues uh, and making that a kind of, almost a bit of a crusade, to be honest with you, for the school, to give it something to coalesce around and, and make it the, as head, to take some of the sting out of the word gay, for example, at assemblies, by using it, by talking about our group. And it's a, it's a core group of young people, there are about 24 or so, I think, who've worked together to deliver assemblies, to uh, inform the management team of the school about what would be a useful way of uh, building a, a, an ever more equal culture, of becoming involved themselves in local uh, LGBT events, such as Fife Pride, which is, is coming up in Kirkcaldy shortly, uh, and a kind of budding arrangement for younger kids who may be either identifying uh, as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, possibly, as they come through the school, or keen to support that whole agenda as an ally so I kind of peer, you know, just make it, as I say, the rules are fine, but it's a, a, some business guru, I remember, once said that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm. It's about how the school feels as much as what happens when, you know, somebody reports an incident of bullying. I think it's also important to separate out prejudice-based bullying from incidents and, and things that happen through peer groups falling out. That's important. But clearly sexual harassment is a prejudice-based bullying. Uh, but sometimes kids get mixed up, and, and parents too, when g groups fall out, and the, and the one that's not doing so well out of the fallout feels they're bullied. The feelings will be real, mm -hmm. but I think we must separate that out against prejudice-based stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful at the moment. I don't know if Cameron would want to say about the, about the LGBT group, or if that's the right time. Or... Yeah, Cameron, if you want to come in. Well, yeah, about the LGBT group, it's it's a good support network for kids who are feeling like they're being victimised due to their sexuality or gender identity. The LGBT club really supports them and how they feel and how they identify. 
which also are into our assemblies that we give to the school, is really give people the knowledge so people don't go by wrong stereotypes and judge people. It's really made people educated on different gender identities and sexualities so people don't mindlessly insult because they are not educated on the, in the situation that the child who identifies otherwise is. It's the whole general vibes of the school. The school is a very accepting place, with Mr. Allen at assemblies using words like gay, lesbian, transgender, just not taking away, taking away the stigma of it. It's making it very accepted and it's becoming the norm so far that it's now, I've, I would say, it's uncool for anyone in our school to bully someone else because everyone else would look at them and be like, why are you doing that? It's not a cool thing, it's not a fun thing to be doing. It's now, it's now generally accepted so it's accepted to such a point where people aren't even thinking about doing it. Uh, you may have a few isolated cases, but that's probably because of some other reason that they're bullying. But it's a fact of the, with the LGBT group and Mr. Allen's support through the assemblies and education through SE classes, we have really made the school an accepting and really safe place for LGBT youth. I think that safe place is, is one of the things we heard, we've heard a lot of, is, is making it safe. And thanks for your contribution, Cameron. It's re really, really helpful. I want to come to the Scouts, because I know, because David has talked about you a lot and the work that the Scouts Association has undertaken in order to tackle some of the, the real uh, issues that, that young men are facing. Um, and uh, maybe, you know, I'll just let you tell us. Go. OK, thanks very much indeed. So, yes, in Scouts, we, we do have a zero tolerance of bullying. And I think, um, like you've said in the school, part of how we deal with that is to have a, an inclusive culture and have a, create a safe place for all young people. And that's partly through sort of self-management that y young people take responsibility for themselves and others and do create through our, through our strong value base. That would be really our, our first approach to tackling um, bullying and any behaviour that's that's inappropriate and we do train all our adults so uh, adult training would be another strand um, and certainly if there's any serious bullying happening we would go through our our safeguarding procedures but in scouting we are um, we do see ourselves as being very inclusive both to boys and girls and young men and young women because scouting is now co-educational right through the organisation and certainly the one that's probably most evident is um, our LGBTI and our, our participation in, in pride parades and just making that making our making that more, much more acceptable in scouting, um, right through scouting. So we have quite a lot of our um, senior volunteers who are now openly gay, which maybe 10 years ago would, would have been, you know, maybe not acceptable. Uh, so there's a lot of role models around in scouting for people who are in that community. And just helping young people to be accepting of one another and for it to be okay to be part of that community and be in scouts, which I think is, is for many people um, maybe a challenge yeah. to them, but I think we are working, doing a lot in terms of all our areas of inclusion, but certainly within the LGBTI, I think we're making really good, good progress. Mm -hmm. But I think it's mostly from our really strong value base and saying, you know, we're all scouts, we, and, and we take care of one another, we respect one another, sort of self-respect, respect of others are some of our key values, and that's, it's really through our strong value base that we tackle um, yeah. bullying. Yeah, when you put that into place and you've got that really clear leadership and, and girl guidance the same and the school, does that give you what Cameron just spoke about, was that it's not cool to be bullying anybody or to, to be creating an environment where people feel unsafe? I think so. I think it, because it, it is, we really work with young people in sort of self-management. So, you know, even for our younger young people in both in, in the guide movement and the scout movement, they're in sixes in Cub Scouts and then they're in patrols and scouts where there's a leadership capacity for young people. So they're taking responsibility for the ethos. We have anti-bullying and we would encourage to ha um, codes of behaviour, which would be the adults working with young people if there were challenges to say, okay, how are we going to work as a group? So it's adults working alongside the young people. It's not a top-down approach. It's really helping young people take you know, responsibility and lead take leadership for themselves and the group they work in to self-manage that and progress that as they get older. So I think it's, it is, it's not, it, I think top-down 
just creates a barrier. I think you've really got yeah. to be in there working with the young people, engaging them to, and, and working with where they are to help them create that culture and that, accept, that culture of acceptance. Neve, thanks very much. Uh, uh, and Neve, on the work that STAMP does, and I, I know you very well in the work that, that you do, but maybe you could explain to the committee um, and our, our, our guests around the table the type of work that you're doing, because one of the things that strikes me is the work that you do on consent mm -hmm. and skills is, is very important uh, across all types of bullying about what's, what you know you give permission for and what you don't, but it's also the work that you do in supporting young people who have maybe had a bad experience, and the, then then the guidance and support that you give them and how, how to tackle that. Yeah, so uh, basically the stamp project came from the Lancashire Rape Crisis Centre. Um, our kind of leader is uh, Hannah Brown. She's a, a sexual violence prevention worker, so she seen quite a lot of what was going on. Leading or what uh, the young people she was working with they were seeing was the gender stereotypes portrayed in media were what were causing sexual violence later on in life. So what we were, or what we were kind of do is like we're supposed to be ta we tackle these kind of gender stereotypes and what uh, the rape crisis does as a whole is it doesn't see our sexual violence is not we wouldn't make that wouldn't be equal to bullying but it's what leads up to that. So you've got like sexual harassment, you've got sexual coercion, you've got like just like the idea of like non-consent kind of like it will build up in that you can see in like prejudice bullying so we do quite a lot with um consent like see when you're talking about like kind of teacher training we've actually done some of that like there were some teachers that were really interested like yeah if we want to better what we're doing for the children we're in charge of so we kind of like we were doing lots of teaching about like maybe like uh, concerns with lgbti and then consent and like pse or re or those kind of classes where you're talking about it and what we found was that was really kind of the issue when it came to um kind of like what was going on because we did um we also did a survey and it was just kind of a general survey of kind of what's going on in your school what would you like to see changes in and a lot of what we seen was it did depend on the teacher like if you were to come with them with like a problem with maybe sexual harassment or if they could see something like there was one um i, I can't remember if it was girl or a boy but it was basically someone had put their hand in their thigh and then they kicked up a fuss about it because they were like I, why should they have done that like that wasn't okay and then because they kicked up the fuss it was technically their fault they'd upset whoever had done it to them and it was technically their fault and it's that idea that 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 shouldn't have been how it was done so we wanted to work with that and then just kind of like change that around because it can just really depend teacher to teacher you can kind of get like old-fashioned teachers and it's like oh can I get some like um big strong boys to help me move these boxes and it's just like little things like that and it's really quite undermining uh, so it's like definitely like there are implications in teacher training and the sexual harassment that people can progress because if you do nip it in the bud, like if you stop and you kind of go, no, you can't, you can't do that. Like they're maybe more likely not to. Yeah, they're not like kind of like going on to the like sexual violence, like what you were saying about um, kind of like young girls like making themselves kind of like vulnerable through sex, and we would maybe see it as a case of there is that kind of idea that they are most girls will feel pressured into doing it it's not as if they're doing it to make themselves vulnerable they're already vulnerable and are being forced into the situation so there is that um idea of like why it's like that will go on for like, oh why did you why did you send him those photos like that's why you posted them and it's like well that has like really quite dangerous parallels well what were you wearing when you were raped like there is that kind of idea and it's like really important that teachers and people in like positions of power do realise that that is kind of what's going on, that's what young people think that's going on, and they may not just be in the capacity to do anything about it, so it's really good to get like a kind of base level of like teaching and like guidelines of what's supposed to be going on and what should be taught in terms of consent. What age group are you working with, Eve? Um, we kind of do 16 to 25, it's like a youth thing, so um, you can, uh, you can like, we've got like social media and stuff like that, so you can like follow and interact with us like that, but you can't actually be part of the stamp till you're 16, just because there's quite, obviously there's quite a lot of like sexual violence and consent, so it's just kind of good base. But we kind of we do that, and then also the, the uh, rape crisis centre. I think they might go into schools a wee bit earlier than 16, but then we we don't really do much about that. That's kind of another thing. But we work with like yeah, it's like youngest fifth of us, and six years then. Like, yeah, yeah, fifth and six years <laughs> is when you can join. And then there's a couple of us like I'm going to my third year of uni, so like there's a couple of us just kind of spread about. And what kind of group work would you do with these groups? Um, personally, I've, I've actually never gone in to the groups with it, but it is kind of a, an idea of um, when we were, or well, we were part of one of the groups that when someone came in, and then it was like kind of looking at like it was like to do with kind of like um, 
music videos is quite a way to look at it, and it was just kind of like the idea of like kind of these gender stereotypes. You'd have like women are like glossed over and like half naked, and that was their kind of thing. And it's like, well, no, because they're being like dehumanised, kind of like that. Like, and there is the kind of idea of that, like, um, wait. No, can I? Yeah, I've got a better idea. So, like, um, we kind of did quite a lot on, um, like, slut shaming and victim shaming um, and, like, victim blaming as kind of a big thing on kind of sexual violence and things like that because it is the idea that, like, oh, like, if you don't, you're approved and if you do, you're a slut. Like, there is no there is yeah. no win-win situation yeah. there and it kind of comes from one of the things we found out when we did our survey was that uh, one class, um, all the boys had to spit in a cup and then at the end of it, that cup was the girl that had had sex with numerous guys, and it was just it was like awful. It was like things like that um, are really quite. I've completely lost my train of thought. I'll come back to me. No, it's okay. In a bit. It's, okay. It's, it's okay, Neva. I'll, I'll, I'll let you just to <laughs> catch up. Mary, you wanted to, to, to come in with some questions, yeah? Um, thank you, um, convener. Um, I'm, I'm particularly struck by almost the complete contrast in what um, Hannah and Susanna spoke about and, and the level of harassment and, and bullying that young girls get and the culture in, um, in the school that, that, that Derek um, spoke about. And, and I wonder, um, before I come on to ask Hannah and Susanna a question, if um, Derek could give us some information um, practically about how you change that culture, because culture doesn't change overnight, and it's not just about changing the culture of the way teachers view what they should be doing in schools, but it's about changing the whole school culture. And we've had a number of different people from education um, in here giving us evidence while we've been doing this inquiry. Um, and they've all talked about um, the, the guidance and refreshing guidance and, and training about um, tackling bullying and training about tackling harassment. And, and I have, um, as, as the convener does, I have a bit of a kind of bee in my bonnet about guidance that it sits on a shelf and gets dusty. And once a year it's taken down um, and you say, yeah, yeah, refreshed, let's move on. So how long did it take you to change that culture and how easy was it for you to get all of your teaching staff on board, that this was the culture you wanted to embed in the school and they all had to get on board with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a, a difficult one to reflect on, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, although I must say that once you've got a, a very strong and well-established and, and reasonable and very simple set of values, it makes a difference. Because I think the, the school's mission statement before had appeared in the prospectus and it was half a page that nobody could remember what it was meant to be about. I don't think you can judge any success unless you know what you're trying to achieve. So those three core values were really important. And I must say, in terms of staffing, I was lucky in that in that intervening period, we've had a staff turnover, which has seen about three quarters of the staff being new to the school. That's mm. probably the case now, actually, almost exactly that. So I was able to appoint people who I, I understood and even interview questions. You know, you would always have something in that would test their their ability to be empathic and, and be able to work in an mm. inclusive way. So that's important. Recruitment's important. Uh, and the teacher training was mentioned there by, by Neve. I think it's definitely improving. Um, all the probationers <laughs> have, have built in units within their, their, their teacher education uh, as well on, on equality matters. It's important. But I think by modelling the behaviour also, and again, that symbolic aspect, of getting involved in slightly edgy stuff, if you like. In particular, I think the the uh, decision we, we took on to try and tackle teenage pregnancy in school, it created an openness of culture. If we could do that kind of thing, you know, by having a, there was a contraceptive clinic was established within our premises. It kind of changed the, the, the kind of feel of the place. And it made the young people step up, if you like, and almost feel an, an equal part of something. Yeah, the teachers are in charge, However, it's a collaborative culture that everyone's looking out for everybody else in some ways, I suppose. And just to try and re-emphasise that every opportunity that, that one can, it's important to take every opportunity, every assembly, almost every assembly, to just do something or another that will symbolise that or explain it. I'm with you that policies are great. You know, we need them, we need guidelines, we need, we need rules. But if people are doing anything grudgingly, it will never be done properly for a start. Uh, and it's, it's th this kind of atmosphere, if you like. And, and some, it's difficult for me to actually just define how it is achieved mm. precisely other than through a consistency of approach 
um, that's modelled across mm -hmm. the school, and in particular recruiting young people to reinforce it through groups like Cameron's group or through our buddy programme. There's a bounce back group that the, the, the um, sixth year run, which is to promote resilience of more vulnerable kids that are referred to them by the guidance team, who the, the guidance team feel that um, there'd be a more natural relationship can be established. So I think that is, you know, tying up those kind of networks is really important. Mm. And Cameron, c can I just come to, to, to you briefly? Because how, how quickly did the pupils in the school um, feel comfortable and, and take on board the change in the ethos? Um, because if, if we look at the, the, the figures that the, the guiding um, associations have given us about the number of young people that feel harassed, bullied, intimidated, whatever, um, as, as a pupil in a school, the culture changes. Um, I'm quite sure there would be a, a number of pupils that would just think, yeah, yeah, it's just another policy, we'll just move on, nothing will change. How, how long did it take for the pupils to really become comfortable with the change in the culture and, and know that they, they would be confident if they went to a teacher that their problem would be dealt with? Uh, well, I feel like it was, it, well, over my five years in the school, it started off when I came in, it, was, it wasn't it was accepted to be LGBT+. plus. It wasn't a thing where people would openly talk oh. about it. But by my fourth or fifth year, I felt that I could be completely open as an individual. It was a fact of, it's not a set amount of time. You couldn't say that it started oh. one day and ended the next. It was more a gradual build-up yeah. with... It was it was set into place. It was a policy that got made, and it was a fact that Mr. Allen did not want any form of discrimination in the school. So it was ah sorry, I've lost my chair. Um, it was a fact that it was a point. It was probably the first assembly that was run by the LGBT club. It was that that made people think. Well, that isn't just another rule that we have to mm. follow. It's a rule that is going to be put into place and seriously acted on. Because I could feel completely fine now uh, going to Mr Allen if I ever had a problem. Well, in first year, I, f I would maybe question talking to a guidance teacher or a teacher. But now that Mr Allen has put into place assemblies, there's a club in place, there is set rules. Because we have, if any teacher hears homophobic language, we really strongly promote the stone wall. If you hear it, call mm -hmm. it out. And it, it allows uh, homophobic incidents well, and HBT bullying incidents to be dealt with. And it isn't just a thing where you deal with it once and then that shows that you're making good policy. It's dealt with every time and it's dealt with the same seriousness every time. And while it, I'm, I'm saying every time, like it happens multiple times, it very rarely happens. But if it did happen and if it does happen, it is dealt with seriously, just like any other form of discrimination. And I feel that the culture shift over time, it's a fact of, it wasn't, it was a gradual build up to a good point. Mm -hmm. And we're still building up, we can build up to resilient, even the minor cases of slight individuals who have some form of discrimination or prejudice because of an outside factor. We're still, going, we're still trying to get to the best that we can possibly be. We can be continually improving our culture. But the culture change, I would say, happened with the generalized acceptance and the acceptance of everyone made with a strong hand. It wasn't a, let's not bully anyone. It was a, let's not bully anyone. This is why you shouldn't bully. This is what happens if you bully. And this is what happened to you with the punishment if you bully. And I feel like that's really made our culture a warm place for people to be in. Mm. So the teachers are almost led by example. The teachers actually believe the, the, the culture and ethos in the school. Um, and I take it there'll be a mutual respect between the teaching staff and, and, and all the pupils in the school. Yes, I would agree with that strongly. Uh, uh, the pupil and teaching staff, there is no... Uh, the teaching staff are on some high tower that you can't talk to them. They're down at your level and they would understand any problem that you came with them to. And they would feel... I, I would just presume that they would feel completely comfortable going to Mr <coughs> Allen as he would deal with any problem that anyone had. Okay. If only we could package what's in your school and roll it across, <laughs> across, across Scotland. Can I come now? Like Mary, uh, Mary, just before you, you move on, da David wants to come in with a quick supplementary, right, okay. and then I think Mr Allen yeah. wants to answer back, and then, we, right, then okay. I'll come back to you, Mary. Um, thank you, Convener, and good morning. A support network that the pupils have at school and the mentoring system, how did you manage to engage pupils like that? Because from what, the examples that I have seen, they 
are totally committed to the rules and enthusiastic about the rules. Um, and also, as many people know, Kirkcaldy had one of the highest teenage pregnancy rates in Europe. How did you get the parents engaged? Because when I heard about that as the MSP, you think, here comes my mailbag, what you're going to do, I'm going to be. And I have had not one complaint the whole time the whole, um, it was put in place in the school. So how did you actually engage with the parents and get them on board for that as well? Because that's vitally important to, to have them feed into the system. Uh, I think probably um, the, the key thing is to go through the young people themselves, quite frankly, because you know the best of parents and almost all the parents will listen to their listen to their kids too, because the young people themselves, in terms of the mentoring thing, uh, the, the whole mentoring program we put in, they're, they're, they crave for leadership opportunities. They, they want to do to do good, and, and it was also important to engage local agencies in the work. The NHS, for example. There's, there's clued up and DAPL also were involved in building the training skills for the mentoring program. In terms of parents, you're right, uh, David, it was, uh, it was about communication, it was about keeping it simple, it was about explaining it fully, being fully open from the start. Uh, my first communication was about the statistic, the statistical background. I explained what we intended to do, invited parents into a special parent evening, uh, and, and you know, fortunately got very little reaction. Uh, and equally from our involvement in LGBT stuff, I've had one uh, piece of mail which was anonymous, which was heavily critical. It was clearly from uh, a, a, a person who found it very difficult and had a bit of hate in their heart um, that was homophobic. It's the only communication I've had about the, it was in connection with a visit from Sir Ian McKellen that we had uh, from, as part of the Stonewall Ambassador Programme. And that was the thing I was going to mention, Convener, actually, was the Stonewall bystanders initiative that Cameron mentioned, one of the things that works well with young people, again, in my, in my experience, and it's a long experience of 35 years in teaching, is giving them the chance to be involved in something that's kind of, again, kind of symbolic, because all our young people, I think everybody did in the end, but what, clearly it wasn't compulsory, but they've signed the No Bystanders Charter, and so have all our teachers, all on the same page kind of thing, you know, and we've got it up on the wall pretty prominently um, displayed within school. In fact, it's on a stair, at the top of a stair, so that people see it every now and again, um, and they become conscious of it. I'll make sure it changes slightly um, in the way it's displayed, just to keep people's attention on it. But that kind, of, that kind of symbolic stuff does work with young people, and I don't want to patronise young people, but they do like to be involved in campaigns and things like that. It matters to them. Wristbands, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, it does, in fact. I like that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Just as that this is the Five Pride one, Cameron, you've got them as well. Right? David, does that, no, does that no, answer your question? You. Back to you, Mary. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Thank you. Um, Hannah and um, Susanna, I'm particularly um, I'm, I'm struck by some of the statistics that are in the, the, the information that you've provided. Um, I would go as far as saying I'm actually quite horrified by um, some, some of the figures um, that, that, that you've provided. Um, for 55% um, of teachers to dismiss behaviour is just a bit of banter. Now, clearly, this is across Scotland? Um, across the UK. Across the UK. <laughs> so, for teachers to dismiss um, bullying, sexual harassment, behaviour like this as a bit of banter, there is clearly a very serious, serious problem. Um, and, and I note from the, the paper that you provided, you talk about... Um, compulsory um, sex and relationship um, education, covering online abuse. And given what we've just heard from um, Derek and Cameron about the ethos in, in their school, do you think trying to embed an, an ethos similar to that plus guidance would, would tackle the problem more efficiently? Um, yeah, I think it is about education and building this culture up together because at the moment the stories we are hearing and the stats we've provided are kind of telling us that there's still in schools as a culture of boys will be boys and just a bit banter like you said oh. um, and quite often the stories we hear are it's easy for teachers to call these other quite clearly identifiable problems when there's um, slurs or other language used teachers can quite easily call that out but often when it's a boy yelling at a girl shows your boobs or something like that, teachers will just look the other way because they're just hormonal boys, they'll learn. But actually, sometimes they don't learn and we do need this education to kind of come into play about consent and 
don't know if you're going to add Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think we can't really, we're expecting a lot of girls, if we're, if we're asking them to be standing up and reporting this kind of thing, when they're in a culture of teachers ignoring, um, dismissing, and actually often perpetuating a harassment. I've, um, I personally sat in classrooms with a guidance teacher who sat and watched as a boy walked around the classroom and undid girls' bras through their shirts, um, as well as I had a teacher who put everybody's third year picture up on the board and gave us comments on what the girls looked like. And that was really normal. And I just think schools need to be much clearer with their staff and clamp down on that because there are things that were, there was horrific language from teachers that I reported, that my friends reported, and those teachers still teach my friends. Um, I have a young person in my guides who told me that the teacher who once instructed a boy not to not to be too scared of hitting her because she's a bit of a crazy bitch, um, that he had come in on the first day of school and asked my 13-year-old friend, "So let's see which one of the which of the girls have developed over the summer," which is horrifying, and he should not be allowed to teach. But that has been reported again and again and again at my school, and the girls have been dismissed, and that's. Normal. That was what I experienced the entire way through school, and it's what other girls. Our, our survey clearly shows other girls are seeing that. And the stat that upset me and um, myself is that 25% of girls, 11 to 16, were afraid to put their hand up in class for fear of harassment. That's in class in front of a teacher. It, you know, if girls are expecting abuse in front of the professionals who are supposed to be keeping them safe, they can't learn in that environment, and that's not fair and we shouldn't be expecting them to go to school and deal with that. When you reported um, incidences, what was the reaction from the, the, the teaching staff or the, the, the guidance teacher that you went to? <laughs> Just, the, oh yeah, we'll look at that. We've spoken to him, is going to be monitored. We had a, a senior member of staff come and sit in on some of our lessons for about a week. It was it, it continued. Um, yeah, <laughs> disability slurs as well. Uh, in that classroom and just wasn't dealt with. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeremy. Um, thank you and thanks all very much for coming along. I suppose I've got a couple of questions and maybe to start with you, Hannah, just picking up a bit what Mary has already said. I mean, again, it seems to me this is a criminal thing that are happening that you're talking about as well as child protection issues, which clearly go hand in hand. And I find it unbelievable that teachers of any level in the school wouldn't understand that, because as someone who's not a teacher, that, that seems clear to me. Why do you think that is? Is it they do understand, but they're turning a blind eye, or there generally is a lack of clarity in regard to what a guidance teacher teaching in an average secondary school in Scotland Understands. I think that the culture is just so strong that they don't, they don't, they don't see it. Sometimes I think teachers just have accepted that that's just the baseline of how young men behave in school, when it shouldn't be. And I think often female teachers are intimidated as well and feel like they need to feel that senior management in schools are going to back them up and that there is key like points that like this is unacceptable and that is going to be for the whole school um, and that you will be backed up if you report this because I think uh, you know stories of female teachers being filmed and that being put online them being harassed by teenage boys as well and schools need to be supporting teachers to to deal with that and they need to feel that they can report that and it will be dealt with. I think as well with the online kind of realm of it, sometimes teachers will just think, well, that's not my problem, it's not happening behind the school gates, and they find it quite easy to kind of turn a blind eye to that because they feel that that's not within their realm to deal with it a lot of the time, um, when clearly it's still affecting these people and these issues still need to be brought forward and taken seriously. I, I suppose that leads on to my, my second question to you, then, is clearly as a, a, as a parliament as a committee, we set policy, which is then followed out by local authorities and by head teachers. What, and I appreciate you putting your evidence, different things that you think should happen, but what do you think the big culture change needs to be? Is it 
for support from a head teacher? Is it a change of view from a senior management? What, what do you, if you could have a magic wand, what would be the one thing do you think would start to make a difference? I think if we started with education and starting that early as well about a lot of what you guys have discussed with respect for others and yourselves and um, and a lot of the time as well one of the big issues we face is that girls don't know what they've experienced as sexual harassment they, they know it's made them feel uncomfortable but they don't really know why and because we've got this culture of just ignore it just let boys be boys they, they find it really difficult to deal with whereas if we actually say to girls no you can go and speak to someone about that um, that's not acceptable I think that would, would start to maybe also help girls report this more because we know it is really underreported um, and as well also if we could put a strong obligation on teachers to actually if they see a problem not turn away and actually have to deal with this and go somewhere and if people know that, that there is that in place as well so that they can say no you have to deal with this I know that there's this legislation or policy in place um, and even parents if they knew that as well if they know there's a problem going on in schools they can say that we can hold you to account over this. Yeah, like I would totally agree with that because I think what you're doing in your school sounds absolutely wonderful, but I don't think that should be your responsibility as a head teacher to come up with all that. I think that needs to be national guidance for all schools it needs to be the same because in school, like we knew that if somebody called our friend a racial slur, that that would be reported, that would be written down, that would be recorded and dealt with appropriately and reported to the right people. Um, not the same with sexual harassment and it's discrimination in the same way that racism and homophobia are discrimination and it should be it should have similar guidelines I think and I think girls need to know that they will be taken seriously and that this is that's an incident and it gets dealt with this way and they need to see how it will be dealt with because it's the uncertainty of will this teacher believe me will this teacher make it worse will this teacher ignore me you know because it's luck of the draw, what you're going to get when you report that sort of thing, whether they'll even understand that it was harassment. So teachers need to be given very, very clear guidelines on what qualifies as harassment, what I do with that now, how is that recorded, I think. Okay, uh, thank you. I mean, thank you very much for coming along and sharing that. And, and thank you for what you're doing. I say that as a MSP, but I also say that as a, a father of two daughters who are young coming forward, that we need these issues definitely articulated so much more clearly. Derek, can I just turn to you for one question? I mean, one thing we've heard quite a lot about is online bullying. You know, when I was at school, to some extent, bullying occurred, but you got away at half past three, you got back to your home, you had the weekends away. Um, my niece, who happens to live in Scandinavia, so she's not Scotland, was badly bullied a few years ago, and it happened online. So, you know, she put on her Facebook how would you, as a head teacher, from your experience, because we, we online is almost, it's, it's in your own bedroom, isn't it? I mean, it, it affects you in your own house. How, how do you deal with that? Or do you, as we've heard, I, I appreciate you probably don't, but from maybe your wider experience of talking <coughs> to the head teachers, is it something that schools say, well, that's happening out with school, period? It's not our responsibility. No, that's certainly not my experience. It, it's more the case that that is out with school hours, but it's still something we might be able to do something about. And if we can't, then we'll help you and encourage you to get the police involved if it's a continual harassment campaign. One of the biggest problems for teachers is they don't understand Snapchat and things like that. They don't use it. Um, in particular, Snapchat, I think, is, is probably the worst of them, isn't it? It's the one that disappears after 30 seconds or so. Um, it's difficult to get an evidence trail. Uh, the traditional texting, no, that, that kind of thing, that's more straightforward uh, for us to handle. I've seen us having um, conferences of parents um, to try and resolve difficulties between uh, uh, groups of young people uh, who've had, often due to that kind of social relationship breakdown and fallout. Um, we don't often get the sexual harassment issues on, that, that come to our attention certainly through online things, but I'm sure it happens, but it's not something that, that our, our pupils report very often to guidance teachers. It is a, it's a difficult thing. We need to can just double up the, the emphasis on avoiding situations like that and, and encouraging young people to block those people who are likely to do this kind of thing, to be smart about it, how they use social media. Um, and there isn't, there isn't quite enough evidence, uh, sorry, emphasis uh, on the, the programme within the curriculum, I think, 
I think you're right. It's a, and, and it will change. It changes all the time. There'll be some new app will come out in the next few months. There'll be another way, another tool that might be used in the wrong way. What we, what we have done is use social media in a positive way in our school, though, in that, for example, our LGBT group and our school Twitter feed in particular, although I know Twitter's very old-fashioned for young people, um, we, we try and use social media and use positive social media to try and blank out some of the some of the hate stuff that, that's going to be around there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anne, I was hoping to come back to you anyway, but I know that you wanted in. So if you come in with the points that you want to make, but the question maybe I had for you is: we've heard from a girls' organisation and how they handle some of these things. Maybe get the compare and contrast from a, a, a boys' organisation. Yep. Um, well, scouting is coeducational right through, so we deal, we're working with boys and girls together. So um, we, as I say, we, we really build it into how we work. And I think the point I was going to make was leadership, I think, is hugely important. Um, and I know when the Scout Association at a UK level took on their equal opportunities policy, um, I think that was mid to late 90s, there was this is this is how scouting is now and actually we will if people do not agree with that then there's no place for them in scouting and i think you have to be brave enough to do that and you know we have a policy when we when leaders apply to when people apply to become members of the movement and leaders um there's a paper trail and also they have an interview with the an appointments committee and actually they can then check out their views on some of these aspects in terms of lgbti and um, gender and scouting um, and if, if if depending on the answers they get we would say no to people so we do we do sort of control who we have as leaders because actually we, we strongly believe that scouting should be inclusive and if people don't agree with that then we wouldn't accept them as as, as leaders I think, I suppose, maybe in terms of, um, we very much go, I think, in, particularly in the older age groups, with the young people help to set the agenda for the programme. Well, all through, they help to set the agenda. So we have resources on anti-bullying. We have resources to support people on cyberbullying. But actually, we would, we would very much work with the young people where they are, because they're the people who develop the programme that's of interest to them in conjunction with the leaders. So. We don't um, maybe have such a, a, a strong um, policy. We are doing some research apparently at UK level and we're happy to share the results of that when they, when they come through. But I think the main thing is we would work with young people and we train our leaders and we have a lot of resources. So we would encourage people to develop a programme that deals with young people where they are um, and resource leaders to do that and deal with the issues and things that affect young people's lives. Yeah, thanks very much, Anne. Neve, I want to come back to you because um, Susanna and Ahana had mentioned about what, what the point of reporting, and one of the things that we picked up as a key theme is about how data is collected, how it's used, and how it's then used to change behaviour. But one of the other things we've picked up on is is some young people just do not report. Now I know rape crisis have had a perennial problem from its whole being for all the years it's been in about underreporting and how to tackle underreporting. And I know that in Lanarkshire last year there was maybe about three or four young people's cases and that shot up after Stamp got involved in some of the local high schools. So could you could, could maybe give us an insight into how maybe we could tackle underreporting and support young people in order to report and feel safe to report? Well, obviously, there's like there's lots of really uh, a lot of reasons why people don't uh, report these things, especially um, obviously like uh, sexual violence is really um, a big thing for girls. But obviously, if it does, like, so it does also happen to like guys and like non-conforming and things like that. They feel as if they don't they themselves don't have the platform. They don't have this kind of behind them, but they don't realise that like women don't really have much of it going on either. Like. Um, one of the reasons people might not report is because they do feel like they are made to feel as if it was their fault. Like, just the society and the culture that we're in right now, <coughs> it ab absolutely was not their fault, but they are made to feel as if it was their fault through things like slut shaming, victim blaming is one of the main things. And there's also maybe people don't really know how to do it. Like, especially um, my experience, like, um, I went to a Catholic school and maybe, obviously, everything is very abstinence, like, everything is swept under the carpet. It's not spoken about at all. So if it does happen... You, like the the fear was that you would be made to feel as if it was your fault. Like why on earth would you be doing that anyway? And it's like, well, but that's not really the point. The point is that it happened to you, and people just don't feel as if they have the voice to do it. So the kind of the idea of like safe space and like respecting other people, like 
you have like your body autonomy is yours like it, your body is your like yours no one can take that away from you and it's the idea that you need to respect that and people need to respect you as well and they need to respect your voice and they need to respect that you feel uncomfortable about these things you need to they need to respect that like no you don't like that no you don't want to do that like there is that severe lack but that seems more of a society thing so like we can't just change society like as you were saying like overnight that's not how it happens but the idea of like safe spaces and people being like taught on how to deal with it because it's a very sensitive subject you can't just have anyone being like oh right okay this is what we're going to do you need like proper training and like obviously it's a very like it's a damaging psychological experience to have experienced any kind of sexual harassment or any sexual abuse and also just in schools you maybe feel as if you you don't really have that kind of you don't have anything like that like especially for myself we didn't really have any like equalities groups and lgbt groups like we um, the people that uh, came from my school, like my friends that we came from, we were in stamp from the beginning, and we get into it through. Do, we did the UK Edinburgh Award, and it was uh, the guy that we were working with. It was like, oh well, I've heard about this uh, woman that's doing this. Do you guys fancy it? And it's like, oh yeah, we'll give it a wee shot. Like that's how we get into it. It was never, it was never brought to us from like a kind of higher, like a higher power. Like it wasn't really brought in from like senior senior management, which is what it's done in other schools. Like personally for ourselves, we had to actually go out and find things to do it, as opposed to the resources being there for us. So like, I think the idea of having those kind of resources there, like you were saying, like about guiding schools or not guiding schools, like kind of guidance, just being like kind of kept away and like it's there, but no one really talks about it. No one really expects you to use it, and that was the kind of feeling for us. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know who my guiding teacher was. To be honest, like I couldn't tell you. Um, and it is that way that the. Th there are things out there for you, but you do need to go and find it. So I think they need to be more available, and you need to be like, you need to be like, this is okay for you to go and talk about this. It's also okay if you don't want to talk about it, but it is there for you. Like, especially with the rape crisis, there's like, um, I think there's maybe like eleven or thirteen across Scotland. But like, especially for us, like we've got one in Lanarkshire, you've also got one in Glasgow. You can drop in, you can phone up, like you can do these things, and it's really important for people to know that those resources are there for you, even if you do have to go find it yourself. Mm -hmm. But what we we would like to see is that you didn't have to go and find it. The information was there readily given to you, and you didn't feel embarrassed and hurt about it. But like, and feel embarrassed and like blame yourself for it. But the reason you do blame yourself is this culture of like victim blaming and like yeah. slut shaming and like, oh, what were you wearing? Like, had you had too much to drink? Oh, well, like, is your boyfriend? Does it really matter? Does it really count? And it's like, yeah, it does. Like, it's all there for you. And obviously, um, LGBTI plus um, communities themselves have their own. Um, like oppression of their own issues to deal with, out with being like a cis straight woman and all that kind of stuff. So there's also more needs to be put into that, more needs to be put into like male survivors of sexual violence. There needs to be just kind of more about it. It's just, it's not talked about. Like there's a thing, like especially for uh, myself, it just, you didn't talk about it. Like, especially with like, because obviously like, um, yeah. So like um, when you're in kind of like a, kind of Catholic school setting, like obviously the idea is like no sex before marriage, you abstain from it and then you don't do any of these things. But obviously you do, like you do go out and like you go meet people and like you kiss people at parties and you do all this. So like the idea was that it was just ignored, like you weren't supposed to be doing it, so why should we give you anything for it? But I think the idea should be recognised that people are going out. People are maybe going out and having like a drink at the weekends, they've got boyfriends, they've got girlfriends, they've got whatever, like that information needs to be there. It shouldn't just be the idea that no, it doesn't happen because we say it doesn't happen. Like, it just needs to be kind of. Do, do you think, Neve, that for some young people that that you came through school with, it was easier to go and report out with the school? Absolutely. I would have the school? reported within my school. I would have always, I would have gone out and found something on my own than report in my school. And since Stamps been involved, do you think that's changed? Well, I got involved in Stamp when I was in sixth year, so, so I didn't really, I right, okay, haven't been okay. in school then for quite some time. But my brother is in, um, he's still in school, and it's maybe not kind of in ties, but him and a couple of his pals and a couple of um, people the year above him were quite interested in making like an equality group so they could talk about like feminism, they could talk about LGBT, they could talk about like sexual violence, and just like like an equalities committee, like kind of what you would want to do, and just like different issues that could be tackled, and then. They were told that if you get however many signatures, we'll sort this up for you. And it never really happened. But what's really quite, for some odd reason, I get added into the Facebook group for it. So I get like the notifications. For some, they will still, like, they kind of work away. They don't have an official thing, but they'll maybe post things. So they're like, oh, did you hear, like, like how, how awful is this? Like, why, why do we still not have this group for this? Um, so there's, like, it, it, feel, it looks as if not much has happened, but there is kind of 
there's like a want for it, there is a want for it, there's obviously a need for it, but like young people do want this. Like um, one of the things we found in our survey was that people were like, one of the questions was maybe, um, have you seen, have, like, have you ever like seen or heard or experienced like sexism or sexual harassment in your school? And maybe like, well, um, I'm maybe not sure because I haven't seen it, I haven't heard it, but I'm not denying that it's not going on. Like. There is like there's a certain like there's a knowledge there's a knowing that stuff is going on about it and people do want to change it but obviously you're like a fourth year student like there is only so much you can do without the help of another teacher or without the help of like some sort of management position like within the school so it should be down to it should be the teacher realizing that this is actually what their students want to do like this is what they're interested in this is what's affecting them right now we should put more effort into this as opposed to them like obviously it's great seeing their Facebook go but like. That's all it is. It's just like, it's maybe like 20, 30 of them doing this. I suppose it could be like a school wide thing and it's not really there. Like, see, when you're talking about um, all the stuff you've done, like that seems completely alien to me. Like, it sounds amazing, it sounds brilliant, but that's like, I would never imagine that in a school setting, like at all. Mm -hmm. Gail, Gail, did you want to come in? Yeah, the convener, thanks very much. Um, I just, I wanted to ask, um, first of all, I mean, obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but when I was at school, we didn't have all the social media and all that sort of stuff. And all this picture and video sharing is, you know, really ramped up since, you know, the sort of bullying that my generation faced at school. And it's just awful hearing some of these stories. It really is. Um, in your um, experience of um, when you gathered all your evidence, is there any kind of gaping gaps that you can see between local authorities in Scotland in particular, or is it, is it totally school dependent? You can't break down our evidence because it's gathered from across the UK, so okay. we don't know the different um, sectors. Okay. Um, and I was, I was reading um, your evidence, and certainly, to, to go back to my experience of school, one of the, the, the biggest um, the, the worst times for me as a teenage girl going through puberty was PE and sport. And um, I don't know, maybe Derek as well, or Cameron, you might want to come in on that too. I mean, there have been various suggestions and, 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 the, and the evidence um, from the, the member from Glasgow about the, the Cayley dancing, and instead of telling the boys, stop making the comments, mm -hmm. how about you just wear leggings and a long sleeve mm -hmm. t-shirt? just. I, yeah, I, I find that yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. I really do find it unbelievable. Um, I mean, obviously it's true, but, you know, unbelievable in that yeah. kind of... I really don't want to believe it sort of sense. Um, but how do you get over that sort of... I mean, especially swimming lessons are particularly difficult in teenage years. Would you have separate lessons for males and females? I mean, obviously with your ethos, it's probably a lot easier to do, but in a lot of schools, it's... You know, like you say, that ethos is still very much prevalent. How, how would you suggest tackling that sort of harassment? Um, I think it's something we would look to look a lot more into because we have heard different um, stories from people, from girls who have had um, co-ed classes and girls-only classes. But certainly, um, as a girl-only, girl-led organisation, it is something that we really value, having a girl-only space. I mean, um, in our own units, anyway, we know that girls feel a lot more confident when... They don't maybe need to think about the pressures of boys being there. Um, so from that point of view, it's something we'd like to look at more. Okay. Yeah, certainly we, we do uh, a bit of both as well. We've got some um, co-educational and some uh, single sex groups for PE. We also encourage or, you know, at least permit or whatever uh, in terms of the, 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 the kit for PE. It's, it's quite important that, you know, a modest kit is perfectly acceptable, shell suit or whatever for if there are any girls um, to wear. Um, I, it's not an area I've got a great deal of, uh, you know, knowledge of. I don't know if Cameron would have any comments about, about PE lessons. Cameron, it's a, it's a source of difficulty for young people. Uh, well, in my experience of uh, PE, I took it as a subject, so it was a lot of, even taking it as a subject, it was a very split between male and female. While there was more male, so I was only predominantly in all-male PE classes, during my core PE, uh, there was quite split classes for some of the time. 
uh, personally in our school, I didn't really see any form of sexual harassment. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but uh, it seemed it wasn't a it wasn't a thing. It wasn't people. Uh, uh, I'm losing the I'm losing the word, but it wasn't people mocking other people or staring or making comments about if a girl's wearing shorts that are about a little bit too short. It was a fact that everyone was comfortable wearing what they were wearing, and nobody was looking at anyone or making comments. It was people were there to do a sport. It wasn't a fact of it was there for. I couldn't see any sexual harassment in my personal experience. Good. Just we we are out almost out of time uh, for this panel this morning. We ha we do have a, a second panel, but I've got one quick question. It's on the the, the girl guiding um, survey. And, and hopefully maybe include it in the, the scout surveys you're, you're going forward, is the impact on uh, health outcomes for young people, whether it's, it's men mental health or physical health, uh, and the impact that bullying would have on that or be the source of the, the, the health um, issues. I don't know, Hannah or Susanna, if, if in your work that you've done, and I know you've done some work, Girl Guides, a few years ago on mental health, and whether that's something that you would maybe take forward now? Yeah, we think there's definitely a clear link between the bullying and the harassment the girls experience at school and um, mental health issues. And it's something I think it was um, last year's survey focused a lot on as well. And we've also brought out other resources to um, help build resilience to that as well. Um, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> we've got this new resource called Think Resilient, which is a peer education scheme. So we've got a peer education scheme and we've got various like packs that they can take out um, and do with units of girls from they're tailored to different age groups. So like the rainbows, which are five to seven, right up to like senior <laughs> section, which is four, well guides, isn't it? That it goes up to yeah. ten to fourteen. Um, so we've got one Think Resilient, which is about mental health and um, yeah, it's really good. So, like, from early ages, it's it's appropriate. It's tailored to talking about, like, friendships and bouncing back from when things are difficult. Um, and, I like, think as well, when we talk about, like, the effects it has on girls, like, um, we see in our stats that we've provided that the girls, as you said, don't feel comfortable speaking in class, and that's also not just reporting these instances but also just contributing in classes and they maybe won't take certain subjects because they know perpetrators are going to be in those subjects more. Um, so it, it is having an effect on their overall education as well as their mental health as well. Yeah, and so would you say, because we focused a lot of our attention on education, would, would you say your experience is that given the consequences of prejudice-based bullying and bullying in the class and the, the impact that can then have on, on an individual's uh, health, that it would be a public health issue rather than just an education issue? Yeah, because it, it stops... It's, it, it stops girls doing it what spells they want over, to do. yeah. Uh -huh. And especially in regards to PE, like, feeling uncomfortable. I didn't think I was a sporty person in school because I hated PE so much. And part of that was being in co-ed classes where I was afraid um, to be there because I was watching girls get assaulted and catcalled and horrible things happening. And then when I, I was like, oh, why do I suddenly enjoy PE more now that I'm in a girls only class? And it shouldn't be like that. Girls should be able to enjoy sport and enjoy PE, whether there's boys there or not, because there shouldn't be a culture of, you know, I, I would hope that it would be like your school, like what you were saying with... Mm -hmm. Even yeah. the consequences, like we've said, when you do report it, a lot of the time girls feel, like get the pressure put on them. Why have you said something? It was just meant to be a joke. And also, even in a lot of the stories we've heard, is that the schools try and protect the actual perpetrator who's been doing it because mm -hmm. he's mm -hmm. just young, or whoever it is is just young. They don't know what they're saying. They've not been educated. But actually, a lot of the times they have been educated. Everybody knows that it's not acceptable what they've done, but it's protecting their future, whereas the consequences, obviously, with mental health and other things affect girls for the rest of their lives as well and yeah. to wider society too. That's a good point. We are going to have to finish there. We could... Oh, David, go for it then. You're making faces at me. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously see my face there. Uh, thank you, come here once again. On the, on the table today, we have two of the largest youth organisations in Scotland. I think the Scout membership now is over 50,000. Um, why is it? Because we've been talking about education and the bullying in schools that... That culture has not been created within the organisations we have. 
and maybe you could expand on is it the engagement of young people or is it a training that we give because these organizations are run by volunteers um, and the support network maybe you could both maybe expand a bit on how that has been so successful um, I think it was just like Susie, you were saying, like a lot of ours is peer led, and like Scouts, um, it starts from the bottom. We kind of take responsibility for setting our own agendas and our own leadership. And I think, as well, in Girl Guiding, a lot of the stuff we do is based on giving girls confidence to do that as well, which schools maybe they don't feel they have that support to do at school. I think I would agree. I think it's, and we are um, over 100 years old, so we've been using the same methodology right throughout and, and basically building up self-confidence and self-esteem in our members. But I think like the school, it's not, it's not a one aspect approach. I think, you know, it's about the programme we have, it's about the values we have, it's about the leadership and the training, and it's all these things are a mesh, and that's what creates the, 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 the positive environment, we hope, for, for all our, our scouts and guides. Um, and I think that's possible in other settings, but I think it's not. There's not one answer to it, but it's about this mix. But yeah. basically, I think working, valuing our young people, and helping them to take responsibility for their environments, um, and giving them responsibility. I think yeah. for us in scouting would certainly be key. I think there's clear parallels between the work that both your organisations do and the work, Derek, that you do in your school. Uh, so obviously they can transfer uh, mm -hmm. over and, 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 and that good practice can be shared. I really do need to finish for this morning because we do have a second panel and I want my uh, members to have a quick comfort break in order to prepare for the next panel. So I'm going to uh, thank you all. And if you go away and you think I should have said this or I should have told them that, please get in touch with the clerks. We're currently compiling the report. Hopefully uh, to be released uh, in a few weeks' time. Uh, we have the Cabinet Secretary with us next week and we have the Faith Panel with us this morning. So that should really round off uh, uh, very nicely all of our evidence. But thank you so much for all of your contributions today and uh, in the past and going forward. And I'm going to suspend committee now for five minutes for a quick comfort break and allow us to have our other panel put in place. Thank you so much.
Good morning and welcome back to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and we will continue on with our uh, agenda item two this morning which is a continuation of our inquiry on uh, school bullying and prejudice-based bullying in schools. Um, can I welcome uh, to committee this morning, a new panel. Uh, we are missing a panel member, but we hopefully will we'll be tracking that person down and they'll, jo they'll join us eminently. But uh, to get us kicked off this morning, can I make some introductions uh, and welcome to committee this morning, Anthony Horan, who is the director of the Catholic Parliamentary Office of the Catholic Bishops' Conference in Scotland. Welcome, Anthony. Dr. Reverend Dr. Richard Fraser, who's the convener of the Church and Society Council of the Church of Scotland. Welcome. Uh, um, Samina Dean, who is a youth worker with Scotland Against Criminalising Communities. Welcome, Samina. Brittany Rattel, who is a youth worker and representative for the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities. And Charlene Lynch, who is a secular, the Secretary of the Secular... Try and say that with dear children. The Secretary of the Scottish Secular Society. Um, thank you very much for, for coming along this morning. We, we're hoping that Imam will be joining us uh, uh, quite soon, uh, but we'll, we'll continue on because we are very, very tight for time and we want to hear from you this morning. We've got some written evidence from you all and thank you so much for that. It always helps us to inform our deliberations and, and, and the questions that, that we, we want to ask. But I think what I'll do to kick off with is to give each one of you a, a couple of minutes to explain who you are, what you do and where you think it's relevant to the work that you do to the, the inquiry that we're undertaking. Anthony, I wonder if we just start with you because you're right facing me. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as the convener is saying, thank you, convener. Um, I'm Anthony Horan, director of the Catholic Parliamentary Office uh, of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of Scotland. And um, first of all, I'd just like to say that the Bishops' Conference of Scotland is pleased to participate uh, in this, uh, with this committee in this inquiry and uh, to contribute to the discussions around tackling prejudice-based bullying um, in schools and indeed beyond. Um, now, my, my job as a director of the Catholic Parliamentary Office is essentially to engage with, with Parliament uh, and with government, so uh, we felt that that would be appropriate for me to attend here today, um, given that that's my role. I also have an overview of the Catholic Church and the various agencies uh, of the Church, which includes the Scottish Catholic Education Service, and uh, you've already heard from Barbara Cooper, the director of the Scottish Catholic Education Service at a... a uh, evidence session in January. So I have that sort of overview of, of the church and all the various agencies and I'm responsible for engaging with Parliament so it was felt that it would be fitting for me to uh, attend today and as I say we're very keen to assist the committee in whatever way we can uh, and to of course try to, to eradicate and to, to tackle bullying in all its forms. Okay, th thanks very much. Uh, Reverend Fraser. Yes, I'm Richard Fraser. I'm a uh, Parish Minister of the Church of Scotland, just up the road at Greyfriars Kirk, and I'm also convener of the Church and Society Council of the Church of Scotland. Um, we're very glad to be part of this. I think that one of the commitments that we want to make as, as a church is that we're very committed to human flourishing and to enabling young people to reach their best. And I think one of the things I would say personally is that, you know, any young person that comes into contact with the church, I would hate to think that we would find a way of making them feel diminished or in any way intimidated by that experience. And part of our role um, as Church and Society Council is to help the church in its relationship with schools, in its relationship with education, to find ways in which we can be in the vanguard of promoting human flourishing, enabling people to reach their best and not feel that in any sense their encounter with a faith community, and in our case, the Church of Scotland, should in any way make them feel worse about themselves. I think one of the things, one of the observations I would make just at this stage is that having read some of the evidence that's come in from other groups, it's quite clear that there's a common thread about an issue about young people being singled out because they fit into a category, and that yeah. category might be a faith community or it might be a non-faith community and feeling in some way that they're put on the spot because of that. And I think that's, a, that's an issue, that's a common thread that runs through a lot of the submissions that I find it really an intriguing one there. And I suppose one of the areas that I think we're interested in doing is being in the vanguard of trying to promote tolerance, pluralism, respectful dialogue, and finding ways in which we can reshape 
the contribution that the church makes to that throughout Scotland. Yep. Thank you very much. Samina. Hi. I'm Samina Dean, and I'm here due to a written submission by um, Scotland Against Criminalising Communities, who have endorsed and supported my survey on Islamophobia in Edinburgh schools, which is due to um, my own children experiencing Islamophobia. Um, I wanted to know how widespread this was, so I spoke to, with 100 Muslim children who go to Edinburgh schools, and I wanted their experiences on Islamophobia. Thank, thank you, Samina. Brittany. I'm Brittany Artell and I am the youth worker for the Jewish community of Scotland. I predominantly work in Glasgow because that's where the largest concentration of Jews are. I have done some work in Edinburgh as well. A lot of what I do is going into schools and running uh, Jewish assemblies or lunch clubs. Sometimes these are also attended by non-Jewish students, so it is a chance to act as an ambassador for Judaism as well. Um, I also work outside of the schools, so I work with youth movements, largely supporting ones that already exist. Um, there's a large number of Jewish youth movements in the UK and a few of them make it up to Scotland as well. So I do work with the youth in and out of school. Okay, thank you. Charlie. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, my name is Charlie Lynch. I'm secretary of the Scottish Secular Society. Um, the other members of the panel may, I imagine, will know that secularism is rather old, but our society is rather new. Um, I would like to thank the convener and your colleagues for being willing to listen to the voices and evidence of those of non-faith as well as those from a faith background and I look forward to contributing to discussions. Thank, thank, you. Th thank you very much. I'm going to go, go to some opening questions, and I know, Jeremy, you were uh, wanted to come in oh, with some sure. questions. <laughs> you were listening there. <laughs> so. I was listening there, yes. Yeah. Um, well, good morning, uh, and thank you all very much for coming along. I, I, mean, I think it's been helpful to have some evidence from uh, both the Church of Scotland and from the Catholic Church, and, and sadly also from the, uh, the submission in, um, in regard to kind of faith... We, we, we've talked a lot in the last number of weeks um, about different categories, and I think um, we've heard that people who feel like they're in a minority, whatever that minority is within a school, often feel that they are victimised for that belief. And we've seen, you've given examples of people from different faith communities who feel that they have been bullied because of either a, a belief or a faith, or um, an understanding. And I suppose the question which I asked the previous group would be, what do you think can be done by Scottish Government to help the faith communities feel that they have as much protection as gender and sexuality and all the other protected areas? Because perhaps it's the one that's sometimes forgotten about in regard to the five. I'm, I don't know whether you want to go along the line or who wants to go first, but it's a general question. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I, I think the problem that we have, and it was alluded to at the first session, is there's, a, there's this culture of, it's almost like, uh, there's this culture of disquiet, this fear, culture of fear of being open about, in this, in this case, you're being open about your faith. Um, of course, there's other protected characteristics and other characteristics that people have that um, they might feel uncomfortable about speaking openly about. And, and of course, I, I know the committee's taking evidence on that. But in this case, where I think there's a lot of people feel just very, very fearful about just being even being open about their faith. It's not that they're trying to impose their views on anyone, just actually op speaking openly about it. And some of the evidence that I've got um, from from some of the young people in, in schools uh, in terms of anti-Catholic um, bullying, it's quite, it's quite disappointing uh, to see that they can't even just simply admit that that's or be open, that they have a Catholic faith and they hold certain values. So I just think there's a, there's a real culture of fear. And I think that it's exacerbated, and again, this was mentioned in the first session, exacerbated by the existence of social media, which has become a platform for people to to put forward hateful views and to, 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 to discriminate and so on and so forth. And, and that's, that's something that I think we need to deal with. I need to look, we really, really need to look at that culture that is existing because of the existence of social media. But what is further exacerbated by, and I think this is really important, is the behaviour of adults on social media. If Adults can't behave, and I'm talking about professional people as well, and you see some of the things that some people say to one another on social media. 
if adults can't behave, how, how on earth can we, we expect our children to behave? So I just think that there's a, just this deep culture um, of fear. And uh, I think it's very, very difficult to, for, for anyone to, to come up with the, 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 the right answer as to how to deal with it. Um, what certainly we in the church have been doing, um, we do it at a national level and a local level, is that we work with other uh, church groups, other Christian denominations, other faith groups, uh, in order to try and build up a culture of respect and tolerance among faith communities. And, uh, and, and even beyond that, I know that in my own parish that we have a youth group which reaches out to all children um, across uh, the community. Uh, we recently had uh, a welcoming day for refugees who'd recently uh, come into the community from Syria. Uh, these kind of things are very, very important at that local level and I think we need to keep encouraging them and I think also we shouldn't underestimate the amount of that kind of thing that's going on just now in our society and in our communities um, and it's useful to bear that in mind but from a national perspective um, it's I don't think there's any easy answer but I think that what we need to try and do is we need to tackle this culture of fear which exists as I say because People can't even just simply be open about who they are and what values they stand for. And that's a real concern, especially for young people. Yeah, Reverend Fraser. OK, thank you. Yes, um, thank you for that question as well, Jeremy. Um, there's something I think that's really important that was echoed in the last um, consultation earlier this morning that is an issue about what might be described as religious and secular literacy amongst those who are educating our young people. Um, if, if a teacher will say, as we heard this morning, well, that's just boys will be boys. That's, you've just got to put up with that and put on a pair of tights rather than just wearing shorts in the gym. That, that's a kind of outrage, isn't it? I mean, it's a kind of extraordinary lack of awareness and sensitivity on the part of those that we charge with the responsibility of nurturing our young people. And I think in the same way, sometimes what we've seen in the evidence is that young people, whether they're secular, whether they're from any kind of faith community, can sometimes feel that they're singled out, can sometimes feel that they're asked to be an expert in a, in a subject that they really know very little about. Or, or just because they happen to be born into that community doesn't mean to say that they're necessarily literate about the, the aspects of that things, about that faith community or that, or that secular community. So I think, I think the issue of religious literacy is really important. But one of the other religious and secular literacy, I think people need to be taught that it is a legitimate thing in a pluralist, um, multicultural society to learn about how the paths that people follow, the different paths that people follow. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and I think that we need to learn that in the church, in the churches and in faith communities, that, you know, that, we, that we have to, live to learn to live alongside each other. So I think one of the other aspects that, that I think is also important for us to do is to, is to recognise our histories, recognise the, the way in which the journey that we've taken as a society from, a, from one place, um, what Scotland was like in, say, the 16th century at the time of the Reformation to what it's like today as a multicultural, multi-faith, multicultural, um, pluralist society. And that means that within faith communities, we need, and especially within the Church of Scotland that has sometimes exercised quite a lot of power, quite a lot of influence in society, we have to learn a different way of being present which is less about exercising power and control and more about exercising presence and support. And that's a lesson I think we in the Church of Scotland need to learn, but I think it's a lesson that will be of benefit to the whole of society if we can, if we can learn that. So you're nodding away, Samina. Um, yes, I mean, I, I agree with the fact that we need more support, um, uh, definitely. And I think um, that's something that young children, they don't have that outlet. They don't have that support system in place in schools, unfortunately. But um, to, to, to your question, I would like to say, in terms of Muslim children, um, 
it's very difficult for, for us to hide our physical characteristics, whether it be wearing the headscarf, whether it be having a, a beard or even the start of growing a beard, or even now that we're in Ramadan, a lot of the Muslim children will be fasting, so they won't be in, in the lunch hall or in the canteen, or they'll be questioned, oh, why are you not having lunch today? So it, like, there's these visible um, characteristics as a Muslim that you're going to know that, that, okay, this person is a Muslim. So you can't even hide your faith because it's visible. And I think um, due to my study where I spoke with 100 Muslim children, um, one thing that, um, that, that struck me was the fact that um, 67 of them wouldn't even tell a teacher that they were experiencing Islamophobic comments or Islamophobic physical abuse. And the reasons for that was because they felt that the teachers didn't have a proper understanding about their religion, about Islam. And because the teachers didn't have that understanding, they couldn't really understand how that child felt, how that Muslim child felt. Um, and, how, and because they couldn't understand the seriousness, the fact that it was an attack on their identity, and because that teacher couldn't understand that, that they wouldn't help or they wouldn't do anything about it. And the sad thing about my report is that, uh, which was worrying, is that the children who did actually report to, to school teachers, um, you know, a lot of the schools did not even respond. They didn't take any action. And the schools that did, the, ch the children themselves were not even happy with the outcome. So they were left there, felt like injustice had been done. They've um, been attacked due to their, fa their, their faith, due to their identity. Um, and it made them feel really, really scared. Actually, 21 of the 100 children that I spoke with said that they feared and I use the specific word feared, they feared going to school on the basis that they were just a Muslim. And the reasons that they get, gave, and I quote, is because they were scared of abuse and getting attacked. Because what happens on the news, what people might think of me because I wear hijab, and I was scared if I might get attacked. So this, is, this, was coming, this was quite prominent in how the Muslim children were feeling. And just to give you an idea, over 55% of them have encountered verbal um, Islamophobia, verbal Islamophobia, and over 40% of them physical Islamophobia, where they're having their hijabs ripped off, they're being punched, they're being kicked, they're being called a terrorist, they're being called, you know, suicide squad. Um, they, they've been asked if they have bombs and guns under their hijab, and this is like, a, it's, and I don't think this is, even though my study was based in Edinburgh. I actually think that this is happening throughout of Scotland, actually throughout the UK, looking at other studies. Yeah, yeah, th thank. thanks, Samina. It, it almost it r tells the truth about um, all of the evidence that we've heard mm. uh, about, and the numbers are pretty similar. Mm. You know, 59%, mm. 65%, mm. 67% of young people fear reporting. When they do report, they fear it will get worse. When it is reported, they don't get the response that should be the right response. And when you heard from the Kirkcaldy High School this mm -hmm. morning, the way they respond, that's a gold standard, and we would hope that, that we prom promote that. But it, it is pretty clear that the systems, so whatever the discrimination is across any protected, it seems that the systems is where we've been, been let mm -hmm. down. I don't know if, if, Brittany, you would give us some insight into from your perspective, and you'll know uh, the Scottish Government made a statement on Tuesday on hate crime. You'll all know that, but there was a specific recommendation in that about uh, accepting the Holocaust Trust definition of anti-Semitism, and, and whether you have some truth to say to that. Um, hmm. I'm not sure if I have anything specific to say about that um, announcement, although I do think it is very good that there is a definition of anti-Semitism. I think that probably will help combat anti-Semitism. A lot of times it's hard to define exactly what is bad enough to be dealt with. So having a very concrete, clear definition will go a long way. It's that literacy issue that, that Reverend Fraser exactly. spoke about. I actually wrote it? down yeah. that, yeah. that um, phrasing because I really liked that idea of religious and secular literacy. That is something in the uh, reports I submitted that was kind of a common theme in suggestions that in a lot of communities, there will be people that have never met a Jewish person in their life. So how are they supposed to get a clear understanding of what Judaism is? And if you're a religious education teacher, how are you supposed to teach about that when you've probably never actually met someone who represents that faith? Um, so having the chance to educate teachers is one thing, but going at it from the other end is also important. We've acknowledged a lot of students won't feel comfortable speaking to the adults that can help them. They don't think that a report will do anything. Um, 
so in the last session, an important word that came up was bystander. When I talked with some P7 students yesterday, none of them knew what a bystander was. In working on creating a Holocaust education curriculum for S5 and S6 students, my colleague said he didn't think that S5 and S6 students would know what a bystander was. I think if we can start to change that culture, that will be important too. If students don't feel comfortable going to adults, the other approach we can take is to empower them to have a positive impact. I think if we approach it from both ends, that'll have the most effect. But bystander training is probably one of the most important things you can do. That way the people who are being targeted know how to handle it and their friends know how to handle it. It creates a support system from their peers. Charlie, mm -hmm. your perspective. Could you repeat the question, please, convener? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it was to look at, I mean, we're getting clear evidence across the board that mm -hmm. groups, who, for, whether it's um, sexuality, whether it's religion, whether it's gender, the five ones, minority groups feel that they are being excluded yes. and don't feel that they're able to report that to appropriate things. And my question really was, I, I preach there is no magic wand, mm -hmm. but what is one step towards helping that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense? Okay. Well, as you will have read, the gist of our submission is that we're obviously very happy with religious observance as it's currently managed in non-denominational schools. We have started to compile evidence from pupils and from their parents who are atheists who have had all kinds of problems with uh, religious observance. Um, obviously, since this has been established, there is a, a right to opt out. Uh, we are very concerned that frequently people aren't told about this properly. Um, schools try to discourage it in their governance because it is difficult for all kinds of reasons. But this creates a situation of difficulty of conscience for those who are atheists and even those, I would say, those, those are from those from minority faiths. What could be done would be to make a better system in some way to, we have in the past advocated opting in rather than opting out, perhaps uh, there could be changes to the culture of schools to make them more inclusive of minority faiths and people of no faith, you think? Um, we're also aware that there is a lot of variance across the country. Some of the more alarming evidence in our submission, I should add, came from the Western Isles. Um, so there are clear, clear variations and problems. Okay, that's your question, Jeremy. Yes, thank you. Mary. Convener, um, I could, would like to um, kind of follow on the, the, the question that Jeremy posed with, um, with, with Charlie, um, because I'm, I'm quite struck that um, guidelines are widely ignored when, when pupils want to remove themselves from religious um, education, um, and pupils feel intimidated, um, and, and organisations that... Um, on the face of it, are, are there to en encourage um, inclusion and, and encourage interaction, actually have a religious base. Um, how, and I appreciate you say that, that we have to stick more closely to what, what we're being told, but how can we actually ensure that, that pupils feel confident and parents feel confident by going to a school and saying, I don't want my child taking part in any forum of, of religious education. I see. That's a, a very interesting and important series of points. Most obviously, Mary, what's coming up here is that children don't themselves have the right to opt out of things. And I'm aware the Humanist Society is pursuing legal action mm -hmm. at the moment about this, about mm -hmm. what age that takes place at. I'm aware that educational psychologists have tests and means for, dis for um, ascertaining at what point children can make these kind of decisions. And we would like that to be investigated in various ways so people don't feel that they are made to take part in things which they cannot in all conscience agree with. Uh, as for parenting and for parents, we would like schools to display clearly in their handbooks that opting out is an option. We would like them to have proper and meaningful alternative arrangements for children who are opted out uh, so that they are, are not made to feel othered, they are not made to feel different, uh, they're not made to sit alone in a corridor, for example. This is the kind of thing that we hear about. Um, and genuinely, this whole uh, s series of problems is approached in a more compassionate and understanding fashion. Mm. And I suppose you have to find a balance between oh, yes, um, the rise in, for example, Islamophobia, mm -hmm. the, the, the very little understanding there is about Judaism, yeah, yeah. Um, 
So you, ha you have to find a way to balance. Is religious education the only way that we can um, inform and educate pupils in schools about other religions ah. so that we can break down the barriers and people have more understanding? And is that the argument that you're given? Mm. Or do you think there's another way we can inform people about different faiths mm. to, to break down those levels of discrimination? Well... Firstly, what we have almost entirely talked about here is religious observance. The Scottish Secular Society is very pro-religious and moral education, and we actually think there should be more. Mm. We would like there to be more of a philosophical element to it, but in general, we're very for it. Mm -hmm. uh, religious observance, which is kind of uh, activities such as uh, the saying of prayers in a communal setting, the singing of hymns, and so that is a, a different mm. set of problems. So where it's based on one particular faith? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, um, Samina, um, I don't know if you're able to comment. Um, do you think there has been a significant increase in the, um, the intimidation and the bullying and the harassment that, that young um, Muslim children are experiencing, given the culture that we currently exist in? Um, Have you seen a dramatic rise in it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, even I could say, like, back in 2013, um, of... Um, you know, the general theme of being called a terrorist and a bomber was reported by 1,400 children to Childline. That was back in 2013. We're now in 2017, and we're still facing the same thing, but even more. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that it's come to the level where, you know, young Muslim girls are having their hijab pulled off, off their head in school. You know, mm. and uh, children, I'm a youth worker in, by, in profession. And when I was speaking to these 100 children, there was two children in primary school who, if they came to my youth group, I would be filling in the well-being forms right now because of the Islamophobic abuse that they're facing right now. And they're suffering in silence. And it came to a point where I actually, um, having a conversation with the community inspector, asked for a link officer to go into one particular school just because of the well-being of this primary school boy. So the level, I mean, you can, the, the testimonies actually show that some levels of these are criminal offences of what's been happening to these Muslim children. Mm. And is there any proper recording done when, when incidents are reported? Um, when I asked, uh, <coughs> again, the children's testimonies, um, I, <laughs> Uh, the only uh, one, the only uh, recorded test, uh, the recorded thing as a racial incident happened, and that was because of what happened to my primary, my my daughter who's in primary school, and it was because when I spoke to the head teacher, I told them I was do conducting the survey, and the responses that I've had from other schools has been absolutely. Uh, absolutely like minimal and I'm really um, annoyed that it's not been taken seriously then he did turn around and say I'm actually going to record this as a racist incident but what's been happening is that the the teachers who have taken action for example um, the Muslim child um, would get a sorry now for me yes the teacher has acted upon um, by going to, to uh, speak to the, 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 that child the, the victim has received a sorry, but the Muslim child themselves felt there was an injustice done. They felt sorry was not enough because of the abuse that they had to face. It, it was like, sorry is not enough. And they left, even though the teacher had taken an action and, and that child got sorry, it just wasn't enough. That, and the, so there was a sense that the children came back feeling like they had no closure, they had no support, they felt like it wasn't taken seriously. And what I found throughout this whole report is that, and which, is, which I think is going to happen more and more, is that the 33% who said they were going to tell teachers is going to become 0%, because the 67% <coughs> who said they wouldn't, and they give me valid reasons why they wouldn't, because they have done it before and nothing got done, it's going to, you know, it's going to filter down to the 33% said, yeah, we are going to do it, because they know nothing's going to be done. And I think teachers in schools and, you know, authorities, they need to recognise a, a racist, Islamophobic um, incident, a comment, and until that recognition doesn't happen, I don't think um, Islamophobic, I think it's going to get worse. Mm. Okay. Um, and just one more um, brief question. Um, <clears throat> Anthony, I, I wonder, I'm, I'm not sure, were you, were you present for the earlier session? Um, was for the second half of it, right. yes. Because, uh, and thank you for the, the submission um, that, that we've received this morning, and I know that you're aware that um, Barbara Cooper has, has been here before and has given us evidence. And while I appreciate that this session is more based on faith-based um, bullying, um, I, I can't let the opportunity go by without um, 
doing almost a kind of compare and contrast um, with the evidence that you gave us, um, which says that Catholic schools adhere to the same anti-bullying policies as their non-denominational counterparts. As Catholics, we believe in the inherent dignity of each and every human being, and Catholic schools are committed to ensuring that all protected characteristics under the Equality Act share policies aimed at tackling bullying. Mm -hmm. And the evidence that we heard this morning was that Catholic schools sweep everything under the carpet. Um, there are no equality groups, no LGBTI groups. Um, and because they are faith-based school, schools and the faith does not believe in sex before marriage, um, does not support gay marriage, we just don't talk about it. And I'd be interested in your, your comments on that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I heard that, and I can, obviously I can't sort of comment on, on individual cases, but, but I did hear that comment and, uh, and some of the other things that were said in relation to Catholic schools specifically. And we, we do have a job to do in terms of taking on, taking on board those concerns that, that, that the young people have um, and bad experiences that they might have had in Catholic schools. So undoubtedly we need to take that on board. And I think Barbara uh, at the session on the 26th of January did say that she would do that and that she mm -hmm. would uh, take, that, take that forward. And what we've done, in, in fact, since then is in, on the 18th of May, we had a, a training session for uh, secondary school teachers uh, and around 50 of them attended. And there'll be another session at the end of the year for head teachers. And really what we were looking at was, was all of the protected characteristics under the Equality Act 2010 to try and make sure that they're aware of their responsibility under the Equality Act generally and also in relation to those protected characteristics specifically. And that's not leaving any of the protected characteristics out, it's covering all of them. Um, and also we covered the, the public sector equality duty as well, which is important. We also looked at uh, Respect Me and the, the, the very useful resource that that, that, that is um, online to help equip, and all of this was really done just to help equip teachers to, to make sure they were aware of any incidences of uh, bullying. Uh, and, you know, it's not just one or two characteristics, it's across a whole range of characteristics. Um, and uh, and to, to try and, and put processes in place in order to deal with that. Now, this is an ongoing process. Of course, we already have anti-bullying procedures in place. Um, and we, we feel, we'd like to think that they were fa they're fairly robust. But of course, if we continue to get instances where young people uh, are telling us that they've had a bad experience, then of course we need to continually to continue to review that. And I think Mary, you had touched on a very important point earlier, uh, which I completely agree with, is about recording and monitoring. Mm. That is something that we do need to get better at, I think, mm. um, because if we're going to improve the, the, the school experience of our young people, whatever the protected characteristic they come under, we need to know where the issues are. Mm. Um, and because if we record and monitor appropriately, um, across the board, uh, then um, we, will, we will know where the issues are and we will know how then it will better inform us in terms of how we go forward and tackle that. Yeah, and, and clearly the, um, the information we got this morning about um, Kirkcaldy High School and, and the, the ethos and the culture that mm -hmm. they have developed in, in, in that school it is clearly a model that we would love mm -hmm. to see rolled out across mm -hmm. um, all of Scotland and, and they are welcoming and inclusive mm -hmm. of if, of everyone, regardless of their, their beliefs. Um, and, and is that something that you think that the Catholic, the Catholic schools would be able to develop, a similar yeah. model to that? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, um, as, 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 as Reverend Fraser had stated at the outset, um, similar to, to what he said, we, we in, the, in the Catholic community believe in the inherent dignity of every human being. Mm. Um, every human being is made in the image and likeness of God, so they have inherent worth and value, mm. and there is no exceptions to that, and they have to be mm -hmm. abundantly clear mm. about that. Um, every child should feel included, um, and there should be no feelings of exclusion mm. or feeling left out or whatever. Um, and in terms of the, the, the Kirkcaldy example, the, the, I think there's always things that we can learn from. Um, so uh, if there's a, there's a way that we can improve the, the school experience of young people who might be feeling left out, discriminated against or whatever, then I think we should always give consideration to good examples out there that, mm. uh, that, we can, that, that might help us to improve our practice in future. 
Yeah, because certainly evidence we've had at previous sessions um, from young people that have attended um, Catholic schools, uh, there is a bit of work to be done in, mm. in um, relation to sexual identity and sexual mm. um, harassment and discrimination. And I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you say you're, you're going to be doing a bit of work, so we look forward to you taking that forward. Yeah, could, can Anthony, can I just pick up yeah. on that point as well? We've had some evidence from uh, some young people who hold St Joseph's in Dumfries up as a, a really good example mm -hmm. of a school. I don't know whether you know the details of that, that school in, in particular, but especially round about maybe uh, sexual harassment, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sexual assault and uh, orientation mm -hmm. uh, for, for young people and how, how they have handled that. Mm -hmm. And, and we've only had some anecdotal evidence, so we've not had a chance to go and visit the school or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we, I just wondered whether you had any more detail on that and, and, and how that was taken forward and whether it was a leadership thing with the school mm -hmm. or a leadership thing with the whole structure. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid, convener, I can't uh, no, elaborate okay. on that, unfortunately. That was a bit unfair. But, no, no, it's all right. Sorry, but I think one of the things, just to touch, going back to, to, to the, um, the question that Mary had raised as well, um, I, I think it, I think there's a, an also, also a job to be done in terms of making sure people understand um, the, the, the Catholic faith and Catholic values, and I think that's something that many, uh, most of the panel have spoken to in terms of their faith. And I think we do need to, to make sure that people do understand um, what the Catholic faith is and what it stands for. Uh, and, uh, and of course, but that doesn't, uh, that, that wouldn't compromise. We'd never want that to compromise the safety and well-being of all of our children. Yeah. But, uh, but I think it's an important point to remember. How do you cope with where there's tensions in between where your faith sits and, and maybe where, where society is now? How, how do you cope with those tensions? Because that must be really difficult. And, and we've dealt a wee bit with intersectionality and how that affects uh, young people growing up because you're not just a part of one group or one yeah. characteristic. You generally got a, a number of them. How, 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 how would you take forward, you know, Mm -hmm. policy or procedure or uh, learning that, that supports mm -hmm. the, the, the young person that sits in the middle of that intersectionality uh, and the, the tension is maybe with the faith and yeah. with where they are as a person and an individual. Well, first and foremost, as, as I said before, um, we believe in the inherent dignity of each and every human person who's made in the image and likeness of God and that is something that no Catholic person or Christian should, should, should forget. Um, I think we do need to, to make sure that that point is emphasised. Uh, uh, but also, um, we do uh, appreciate that we have to, to look after our young people. And, and we know that there are, in mod particularly in contemporary society, there are tensions with um, certain beliefs that the Catholic faith holds, holds dear. Um, and, uh, but uh, I, I just think that, I don't think we can, um, we can forget that the church still believes that each and every person um, is of intrinsic worth and value. So um, that, that would just be the fundamental starting point. Yeah. But of course, within that, yeah, we, we, we do need to, to cater for all people to, to make sure that no one's rights are uh, impinged, infringed upon um, in, in an unnecessary way. Mm -hmm. I suppose I would pose that same question to, to, to all the faith groups and, and none as well, Reverend Fraser. I think it's... It's really interesting. I mean, in the light of what happened to the, the uh, leader of the Liberal Democrat Party yesterday, it's a really interesting issue that you're raising here about, if you like, people's theological position and the position of the culture. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, we've in the Church of Scotland been wrestling with these issues for, for many years now. And I think one of the things that we've recognised is that we have this term which we use as a constrained difference, and that's the idea of trying to create an organisation because we believe in inclusion, because we believe that no one should feel excluded. How can we live with diversity within our organisation, within our, our church? Because we have LGBT people, LGBTI people who are members of the Church of Scotland. We have ministers who are, who are in same-sex relationships, that kind of thing. So, how do, we, how do we deal with that? How do we live with that, knowing that some people are at different ends of a spectrum? And I think part of how we deal with that, or how we've tried to deal with that, is about, is about taking an approach that involves openness to learning. You know, some years ago, um, the, there was a perspective about sexual identity that was pretty fixed in our society and, and within the, the understanding of the church. And I think that people have maybe 
taken on board some of the evidence, taken on board some of the science, taken on board some of the kind of cultural shifts that have taken place in our society and recognised that we're actually in a different place now in terms of our understanding of human sexuality and human identity than perhaps we were 50 years ago. And we've tried to inculcate that into our thinking. And that's really important. But just on, on the wider issue uh, about, um, uh, you know, I, I, want, I wanted just to kind of endorse what Charlie was saying about um, the importance of literacy, the importance of yeah. understanding. I, I think that's absolutely fundamental. And I think one of the things that is really important that we're also trying to do in the Church of Scotland through the work that we do in education is to find ways in which we can frame the stuff that we do, both in terms of religious, our contribution to religious and moral education and, and, and philosophical education, but also in terms of religious observance. Frame that in such a way that what we're not offering is a dominant position or a position of expectation of belief on people, but rather recognising that we can learn from each other, that we can actually be enriched by learning more about Islam, by learning more about, about um, secularism, by learning more about Buddhism or about Judaism. And that that's the, we should not be afraid of diversity. We need to be enriched by the diversity of our culture. So I think, I think all these things are really important. But what, what I would say is that both in terms of our understanding of human identity and sexual identity, and in terms of our understanding of pluralism, we're on a journey. And what we've got to do, I think, is to put in place those measures and those policies that will support people in taking that journey towards tolerance, towards respect, and towards a deeper understanding of human identity. Yeah, a number of the young people that we've spoken to in the course of this inquiry have say, suggested to us that a way, a way forward in all of this is to have um, decent relationship and friendship. Yeah. Um, uh, not so much training, but awareness raising, understanding. How do you build a relationship? How do you deal with rejection? How do you deal with conflict? Um, and it seems to me that... that the wisdom of the young, uh, I think, will be the common thread through our committee report, uh, because they seem to know what, what needs to be the underpinning, the foundation that allows, you know, that, that flourishing that, 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 that we all want for, for, for young people. And, and I suppose, um, you know, what, what, what you're saying there about not having the dominant, you know, the expectation and the dominant uh, attitude to, to that is, is maybe the, the, the way to, to go. Sure. Now, where I think that, that will be very, very stark, because I think some of the evidence that we've heard over the past few months uh, from especially uh, organisations who support people who have been victims of racist uh, incidents is that there's things coming back now that we thought we had got rid of many, many years ago. And I suppose for, for many minority, you know, or, you know, different groups that, that, that things go up and down as, as it goes. And I suppose, Samina, that, that brings me to, to you and, and the point that, that, that Reverend Fraser made is about how, how, do you, how do you support young people who are facing the, the, the abuse that they, they are facing, but how do you then use those opportunities to educate other young people to uh, have those healthy relationships uh, and, and that, that um, you know, attitude that it's, it's, it's about humankind and, and not about difference in that, that respect. One of the criticisms we've had about religious training in classrooms is that you can't just teach a child that this is how you observe Judaism, this is how you observe Christianity. This is, you need to show the in, interconnections to that and, and, and the understanding of it. And it's, it's how, how do we do that? Give, give me a magic pill that I could put into my report that tells the Scottish Government how to do that? Uh, I wish there was a magic pill. Um, <laughs> it's a really difficult one because um, I think in terms of learning about each other's religions, it's like what you said, when I spoke with the 100 children, 57 of them felt really, you know, happy and proud that Islam was being talked about during their school lessons um, because, you know, that was their religion but the others were felt really uncomfortable and they felt worried because we know in today's climate that you know um, Islam has been falsely linked with terrorism. And that is wherever you go, whether it be in the media or social media, wherever it, it, it's you know, blatantly there. 
and this is what you know other young people are picking up and and, and due to that these you know abuses are, are happening to Muslim children um, when I spoke to them about you know in especially second high school uh, secondary school the, in the curriculum they talk about terrorism they talk about the Francis Burka ban they talk about Saudi Arabia how you know the the women can't drive you know those kind of things that are related to, um, to, to Islam although I wouldn't say terrorism is really related to Islam but when those things were talked about especially terrorism 65% um, of them felt really scared and worried during that lesson and the reason why because they felt as soon as they left that classroom door, as soon as they walked out that door, what was going to happen to them? What were the repercussions of sitting through that lesson? And um, a lot of them felt that during the lesson, everybody would just stare at them, so they would become the centre of attention. And that made them feel really worried and uncomfortable. And um, so I think we really need to go back and actually say, is, are the schools providing a safe haven? for um, religious um, I don't, minorities, uh, for religious people, when they're actually talk, talking about these things, like you know, the terrorist attacks that, that at atrocious terrorist attacks that have happened, over 50, 46 out of the 100 were so scared of going to school the next day because of the repercussions of the backlash. So, you know, it, we know that young uh, children already face a lot of things as, as, you know, adolescents, exams, everything, but then the extra worry on top of that. And I think what was more worrying was, again, the physical characteristics of the girls who wear headscarves. They were more, more, con they were really concerned because they're, they're visibly noticeable that something was going to happen to them and, and things were going to be said to them. And, that, and they were right, that was the case. Is there a, a magic... Uh, pill for that. Um, I think there needs to be recognition and I think it, I, I think it's not been recognised by teachers, it's not been recognised by head teachers or it's definitely not been logged. Um, and I think it's also, um, uh, you know, like people like yourselves, the parliament, the council, unions, teaching unions, the wider society, everybody needs to play a part in this because you know, like my daughters have had Islamophobic um, abuses at school, which has led to me doing this study, you know, as a mum. And the repercussions, you know, to pick up your daughter and she is crying and crying when she comes home because she's told that she belongs to ISIS. You know, and she's like, but I have nothing to do with this. This has got nothing to do with me. And being born, born here, she sees herself as a Scottish person, just like everybody else. Mm. She, yeah, she's a Muslim, but she just, just doesn't understand why everybody is singling her out. And the, physical, the psychological effects that this is having on Muslim children is astounding. I came across Muslim children who wanted to change their name. So we had boys who wanted to change their name. They have the brown appearance, but they could be a different, um, you know, they could be Indian or Sikh or something else. But the fact they had a Muslim name, that meant that they were Muslim, so that meant that they were a target. I had girls who were in S1 who want to, who have made the, their own decision that they want to wear the headscarf when they're in S3. But because they're witnessing what's happening to a girl who's already wearing the headscarf, how she's being isolated, how she's not, um, nobody really wants to be friends with her because she wears that headscarf, they're worrying that in two years' time, is that, is that what that's going to happen to me? You know? And it's these kind of worries and concerns, the psychological pressures that these Muslim children are facing needs to be addressed. And there needs to be an outlet. There needs to be a support, like you said, a support system. And we don't have one in place at all. OK. Brittany and Charlie, I don't know if you want to add to, to that. Um. Yeah, um, I, I will mirror some of what Samina said with, um, with the Jewish students, that when there's a topic that comes up in classes that is Jewishly related, they do feel kind of singled out or stared at by their peers. So obviously, if you're talking about World War II and the Holocaust, um, that's a time when students will kind of feel like they're being singled out, or sometimes they actually are, mm -hmm. um, by teachers wanting to hear the perspective from the Jewish kid in class. Um, which is kind of a problematic attempt, right? Like, it is great to try and hear the voices of other people, but that's not really the right way to be doing it. Um, or when I run a lunch club, there are um, usually slides in the school, and sometimes a teacher will say, okay, you, you, and you, make sure you go, because you're the Jewish students. Um, and it, it's not really the greatest way to try and get students engaged to single them out like that. It is the hardest thing when you're at that age group to be perceived as different. Um, there is one thing I want to highlight as a good practice, though, in terms of uh, religious education. One of the schools I go to, they have actually weekly religious assemblies and students can go to whichever one they'd like. But 
every now and then they also do an interfaith assembly. So there will be a representative of Christianity, a representative of Islam, and myself going as the Jewish representative. We're given a topic to speak on. So the first one we did was the path to God. And each one of us spoke about our religion's perspective on that topic, one yeah. after another. Um, it's actually a great model because the students get to see very rapidly the religions have a lot in common. We do have our differences, but there is so much in common. So that's going back to the idea of focusing on humankind, not difference. And I find that to be a great model. Um, additionally, when it comes to certain holidays, so there's generally a Christmas and an Easter assembly. At that same school, when they have that big assembly, there's a second one that is a joint Jewish-Muslim assembly. So the majority of students go to the Christian one, but the rest have another option. And again, we're doing something where we're talking about the similarities between our religions and uh, kind of connecting those. And I, I do like that a lot as a model. It's not the be all and end all fix, but I do think that's something that could be adapted elsewhere. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. That, thank you. Charlie, hmm. where do I'm, you fit into all of this, Charlie? Yeah, where does no religion fit into this model? That is the, mm -hmm. that is the problem, I think. If there's time, they can have as many representatives as they need. They also do sure. assemblies um, that'll be just based on one faith. So they've also mm -hmm. had Buddhist and Sikh and mm -hmm. other people come in. So. Mm -hmm. If there are representatives, okay. I'm sure that school would love to have more. Yeah. Um, yeah. How might we cope with this type of diversity and catering for it in more rural areas of the country? Or perhaps resources are more stretched, there are not personnel on hand for this kind of diversity. How do we come up with a model that is flexible enough to allow this in different types of scenarios and scales? Oh, I would say that's a challenge for everyone. Again, you know, okay. my, my job, I'm concentrated between okay. Glasgow and Edinburgh. There's mm -hmm. so many areas that... Yeah, yeah. One person course, can only do course. so much. Um, yeah. I, I know my organization mm -hmm. that I'm representing today um, created resources that are approved mm -hmm. by the people they're representing, right? So you get a say in what's okay. being presented. Okay. Again, that requires some degree of funding and support mm -hmm. and things like that for your organization. But mm -hmm. definitely getting a chance to create your own resources that you can disseminate is one way. Okay. But yeah, the, the human piece, there's only yeah. so many of each you know, group that can... Mm -hmm. Do the, work. the normal process is committee is to, to, to come through the chair, but I'm actually Sorry. really enjoying <laughs> this bit of interplay that's going on because it's the point, really. Okay. <laughs> it's the point that if we talk to each other and we understand each other, then we can make a difference. Um, so I'm really enjoy, enjoying that there. We are almost out of time again, which is, is really quite worrying. Gail, I know that you wanted to come in with a quick and Mary wanted to come back in. Gail. I'll, I'll just make a quick point. Um, I've, I've just returned from uh, Bosnia. We spent a couple of nights in Sarajevo and uh, we went up to the Srebrenica Memorial. And um, the, the Remembrance Srebrenica Scotland, which is led by Lorna Hood, the Reverend Lorna Hood, um, have just produced a, an educational pack which they're putting around schools. And I think it's very important in the sense that um, when I was... When I was over there, we got, a, a, well, obviously, we, we chatted to loads of different people. Um, and in history, you get taught about various things around the world. I mean, obviously, the Holocaust is a, is a huge example of that genocide that was, you know, horrific. Um, but also, the, the Srebrenica genocide, you know, Bosnian Muslims killed over 8,000 men and boys within five days. It was absolutely... I can't even go into it because it's still so fresh. It's really upsetting. Um, and I just wondered if that's the sort of thing for, um, you know, Scottish government to be supporting these outside organisations that have these educational um, uh, packs that, that can do that. And I also, you know, wanted to touch on what I, well, you've all said, but, but Charlie brought up about um, teaching children about the different religions and none and that you know it's okay not to have a religion as well and you know ethics and morals you know as an aside to all that too you don't you don't need to be religious to you know to be a good person and I think that you know there is a, a message that we can take away from history as well about you know just all about being humans and respecting each other and trying to stamp out hate and prejudice in society everywhere that we see it and i think that that's a responsibility on all of us so um yeah just really a comment St a statement a statement Thank mary i've got a comment um as well because i suppose if if we take on board the pressures that are on the curriculum the pressures that are on teachers and in order 
to um, really develop an understanding of, as Gail said, all faiths and, and no faiths, because we have to teach it in every single school. It can't just be in one school we concentrate on another faith. Every single school um, has to teach about every faith and no faith. And how do we give that the importance that it needs to have within the curriculum? Because it can't be um, once every three weeks someone comes in and talks to us for 10 minutes. And it can't be something that's outside the normal nine to four school day, to, because then it would become an optional thing and you wouldn't get the buy-in of, of the staff and, and the, the pupils. So it needs to be, in my view, part of the main curriculum, but we need, we need to ensure it's given the importance. And it can't be, I don't think, um, and, and I'll, I'll pick the Catholic schools, and I'm not picking on them for any particular reason in this, in this instance, but a Catholic teacher, does a Catholic teacher know enough about the Muslim faith and the Jewish faith and the Church of Scotland and no faith to stand up in front of a school and say, this is what these people believe and this is why they believe it and this is why we should support them in the same way a school from the, the Christian faith couldn't do it? I just I can oppose the question, but I don't expect you all to answer. She's never gave you any easy ones at all. Anthony. Sorry, I'm sorry. Reverend Fraser, you want to come in? A couple of things there. One is, you know, we talk from the Christian faith about, uh, and, and Anthony's talked about this, you know, about the, the, the inherent dignity of every human person made in the image of God, you know. But what we share is humanity. And when we encounter the human in another person, regardless of their faith or none, then we see something that we can identify with. Mm. And so one of the things I think that I think is really important for us to think about as a society is that we can't leave this down entirely to schools to deal with this yeah. issue. One of, the, or one of the things that we do in, our, in, in the parish just up the road where I'm minister is we've provided space for an organisation called Amina, which is a Muslim women's support group. We also have a, a lunch club that meets in one of our premises for, the, for elderly people in the Islamic community. And it's about friendship. And it's about relationships. And I think that there needs to be more resource. I mean, I know, for example, the Edinburgh Interfaith Association struggles financially to keep going. But what fantastic, what urgent and important work it's doing. And it does seem to me that it's a tragedy, in a way, that these kind of organisations that are about building relationships, building understanding, building friendship, are kind of withering because they don't get the kind of support that they need. In the times that we're talking about, I mean, those stories just make your heart break, you know? And we need to be building those opportunities for people to learn from each other and to build those friendships that will make for a peaceable society and yeah. a peaceable world. That's absolutely crucial. Yep. Do you think government should take a more proactive role in promoting organisations like interfaith groups? Yes. Um, and, yeah. and support them Definitely. in a more open manner? I do, I do, absolutely. Okay. Jeremy, you wanted to be a very quick supplementary. Or just about well, I, I think it's, it's probably going to be close to a statement because I think we are almost out of time. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think it's a, I think I find this really interesting debate. And I think the issue I'm not quite sure how we do is I think it maybe picks up Mary's point and maybe also others is that there's now a lack of ignorance of what does a conservative Muslim believe, what does a conservative Orthodox Jew believe because we live in now such a secular society the concept of what does even an evangelical christian believe today is so manipulated by the media or what does a traditional catholic believe and i suppose the question is taking mary's point is how does a primary school teacher in stockbridge primary today represent that and i think that is something we need to have a bigger discussion with the education committee on which God is coming on, and in that, whether you're an Orthodox Jew, you're a traditional Catholic, whatever, because we, most people no longer go to church, have no connection with the faith communities on a regular basis, we've lost that. And it goes back to your um, issue of, of literacy. And I suppose I would be interested, maybe in a written statement at some point from you all, and is how do we get that literacy back into it? So it doesn't just work in, our, in the cities, but also works in rural Scotland and wherever. So it's more statements, sorry, come yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I mean, I think we, we, we've, we've, we've covered 
all, all of the ground I think we, we wanted to cover with, with you this morning. Uh, the upshot of all of this is the consequences on young people if we don't deal with this. And, and that's really where the thrust of our, our report will go, is about the consequences and how can we prevent those consequences becoming un healthy uh, and that's 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 the main point of all, all of this I think um, so can I thank you so much for your contributions this morning they have been incredibly enlightening they've given us another perspective uh, to the whole dynamic that that has helped us understand it more we are in the process of compiling this report we have the cabinet secretary with us next week which will be the last evidence session on this and we hope to have the report published quite quite soon after that but as you can imagine there is a lot of information in there, and I'm sure some very pointed recommendations, but we'll, 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 we'll go through that. But again, just to thank you all for your participation at committee this morning, your written evidence. And in the next week, if there's anything you think we should have known about, please, could you, could you let us know? Because making those links will be very helpful uh, for us as well, and all the work going forward over the next few years. But I really appreciate your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm now going to suspend committee to go into private. A quick discussion. Thanks.